a mic check one two. What's up, everybody? Stephen Anthony Bailey here. No surprise that I am the host of Hollywood Happy Hour Podcast. How you doing? Got to build my energy up there. Did you hear that? I was like, I started down here, and I was very serious. But then it's like, hey, we're here to have some fun. So let's get to it. How's everybody doing? Hey, we are surviving the uh, the January. A lot of rainfall as I'm recording this January 5th of 2019. Couldn't remember the year for a second. Um, let's see what's going on. What's going on? I am in tech week of uh, our town at Kentwood Players. Yeah, I plugged it. I don't care. It's my podcast. Um, let's see. Today, uh, I've been sitting on this this podcast for a while, uh, much to the chagrin of, uh, see, chagrin's weird because it's got the word grin in it, which sounds like positive and happy, but chagrin means like super pissed. Uh, much to the chagrin of my guest, I've been sitting on this uh, episode for a while because I went to hiatus I, that's plural hiatuses, and, um, and also I was editing the short film that we did called The Intruder, um, and I wanted to release them uh, close together. So that I could get a double whammy, if if I may, of uh, of power on both of them. Uh, the guest is Stephen Vogel. Uh, I've known him. We we had we we do the day job of the uh, the Starbucks, the serving the lattes to the people, and um, he's an actor. He's he is up and coming. He's a hard worker, and he, here's why I like him. He's not here, so I can say nice things about him. Um, would never say them to his face. Um, he is like a movie nerd, like on his breaks, he's in the break room, like watching and studying film. And it reminds me of myself when I used to care, you know, <laughs> no, but that, 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 that craving that he had is, it has is very inspiring of, of like watching all the great performances and just like trying to figure out what they're doing. Like, uh, you know, the way I've, I've, I've studied Dean and Pacino and, and, um, Brando. Uh, yeah, this is an acting episode folks. Uh, a couple actors just talking about acting for a couple hours, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, what else is going on with me? Just, uh, plugging along peeps. Um, my wife, Lady Shannon, is uh, doing her makeup thing. You can check that out. I, I haven't. I've been. So the reason I brought that up isn't just to plug her uh, talents, but also to say like I've enjoyed like letting her, like being the guinea pig, letting her uh, do the makeup on me. And I don't mean like <laughs> she's not like beautifying me. You know, she's not putting blush on my cheeks and like batting up my eyelashes. A, a you know, up to three inches of whatever. I don't even know what I'm saying. I don't even know how to like talk about beauty makeup, but like she's done like really cool characters on me. It's been a lot of fun. We've done, um, now I can't even remember. I know we did this like cool, uh, the Hollywood tower from when back when Disneyland, Disney world still has it. I'm rambling. Hold up. Disneyland used to have this ride called the tower of terror. They don't anymore. It's now like with the guardians of the galaxy. It's fine. Disney World still has it, and uh, anyway, there's bellhops in there, and we decided, like, for one of our looks, I was gonna be this uh, zombie, zombified, dead bellhop, and that was really cool, um, and she's done, like, my ha Halloween makeup and stuff. The last one we did, I was um, uh, Dr. Finkelstein from uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, and that was really cool. She put, like, this prosthetic over my face, and I was inhaling fumes, and you know, got a little lightheaded. It was a lot of fun. Um, I've been, I've done like skull makeup with her. I haven't done any of it. I just sat there and let her put it on me, but you know, it's, it's fun. Cause I get to post it to my little Instagram page. And, uh, anyway, she's getting like really, really good and really, really serious about it. And, uh, so I think I'm going to do one of those soon. And like, I just been writing the blogs and like, you know, making little videos here and there. And, you know, I'm ramping up now that the holidays are over into like, I'm, I'm going to start shooting things again. And that really feels good. Like to be in, in control of, of your career is very, feels very good. It feels very, uh, like it, it feels important, you know? And like, I want to write this blog piece about like restarting your career, 
you know, just because I'm continuing the career doesn't mean that I can't restart it. And because I think restarting is more mental than anything else. Like it's a mental decision that you're not going to stay stagnant or you're not going to stay in the bad habits or you're not. And this can be applied to anything, really. I mean, you know, we all want to do more than we're doing. That's, 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 you know, the basics of human existence is that we are all, we all want to do better. And if we say we don't want to do better, we're probably lying to ourselves, right? Because we can all do better, whether it's in friendships, in our relationships, in our work, in our hobbies. I don't care if you're just playing a video game, like you want to be better at Call of Duty because you're getting sniped up when you're playing with people online. That's why I don't play is because I'm not good. I, I don't have any desire to be good at that. But see, that's partially a lie. Like, I would love to be good at that. I'm just not. And I'm too lazy to put the work in to be good at that. You see what I'm saying? What I'm basically saying is I want to work hard, but I, I'm never going to not suck at Call of Duty. This is my life. But doing the play, like making videos and, you know, shamelessly plugging myself and making podcasts like I'm doing it all and it's it's very exciting and I'm very happy to be doing it and like I've over the last year what I've learned what 2018 taught me is babies shouldn't run the government and also um also that like I don't want to create for creation's sake just to be creating I want to create the things that excite me and uh you know, for so long, I was trying to get like the right manager and the right agent and try to get the casting directors to notice me and give me the audition for the, the shows that I wanted to be on. And it, it wasn't working. And all of the work that I've gotten has attracted itself to me. Now, I'm not going to get too much into like the secret or some shit. But what I will say is like, The work that is I've landed, like the features I've gotten to do and the TV stuff I've gotten to do, it all kind of just fell into my lap. Like, and all this stuff that I was chasing after and and pushing towards, uh, you know, there was no fruit on the tree to harvest. Like, there was nothing there. Like, nothing happened. And when I look back on that time, it's not wasted because I learned something. But I sort of do wish, like, I would have been able to make my own little creations that have my, my, my scripts, whether they're features or shorts or sketches that have been sitting on my desk for years now that I, I, I can see so, so clearly and vividly in my head that I, I would love to make and show everyone in the world. Like that's the work that I should be doing. Not that I don't want those big paid gigs. Like absolutely. I want those. Absolutely. I want to work with Martin Scorsese and, uh, you know, I absolutely, I want to like play like Brad Pitt's son in a movie, duh. But if that doesn't happen, I don't want to be sitting here and going, well, I didn't get to play Brad Pitt's son. That's such a stupid example. (laughs) Anyway, not only did I not get to play Brad Pitt's son, I never got to make the movies that were in my head and on my, in my scripts. And so that's what this year is about for me is like, Yes, I'm going to keep doing the podcast because it's fun, it's easy, and uh, I've already, the train has already left the station on that. Um, But am I going to do like a bunch more showcases and take 18 more sets of headshots and spend, you know, $200 on envelopes and stamps and whatever? No, probably not. I'm probably going to just continue doing what I'm doing, which is building the work and doing the work, and uh, doing great theater that I'm proud of. I'm not going to take any play anymore just because I'm like, well, it's stage time and people will see me. No, I want them to see me do the work that I want to be doing. And if I I don't have a play like that to do at that time, I want to be making films. The reason I'm telling you this is, one, so that I can keep track of myself and uh, make a a verbal contract with myself that I'm putting out into the world saying, Stephen, you're going to do this. And you're going to finish your scripts that are halfway written. And you're going to take them and you're going to get meetings and try to pitch them and and sell them or whatever, you know, like accountability is a big deal for me this year, 2019, you know, because once 2020 hits, I'm going bananas in the roaring 20s. I mean, I'll be like 
you know, the proper age to go bananas. But until then, in this year, it's about creating the things that I should have fucking created a long time ago, bud. <sighs> yeah, so that felt good to say. So, you know, make make things happen. Like, time goes very quickly, including now. Like, I've been talking to you for 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes gone. And I could have been talking about better things. <laughs> No, I don't know, whatever. But what I'm saying is it's becoming more and more clear, like, oh, I've got to do this stuff now because I keep saying I'm going to do it later and later isn't coming. Later is now. This has been very philosophical. It's been very good for me. You've probably hit that fast forward 15 second button like a thousand times and Steven's still talking, but not to his guest. I, I, I love that you're still trying to get away from me. Hit it again. Go ahead. I'm going to sit here in silence for 15 seconds so that once you hit it, I will be talking again. (laughs) Oh, man. I might have had a glass of wine before this. Don't judge me. All right. Let's get to the interview. Thanks for listening to me ramble. You guys are great. Uh, As usual, um, you know, subscribe to the podcast. Share it with your friends. A lot of people don't know what podcasts are or listen yet. You got to get them addicted. You got to get them in there. And... Get them a show that they can wrap their earbuds around. Okay, bud? Um, Yeah, so do that. So share that. Follow me on Shada Bailey's. I'm everywhere, dude. 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 I'm everywhere. Did you guys know that Michael Keaton's making a whiskey? I saw that on his Instagram. That's crazy. Batman's making a whiskey. I want to try it. I do. Anyway, here we go. Episode... Number 15 with Stephen Vogel. Enjoy. Uh, so, we were just talking about the. Uh, you, you saw the new Predator. Yep, I saw the new Predator last night. You sound so disappointed. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I love the franchise. Even, you know, I like, I like the second movie and Predators. This one, you know, I don't know, there's something about this one just felt really. It's like they didn't know what they were doing exactly. It's like they just put all the cards on the table and just like, fuck it, let's do it. I like to start the show on a really depressing note, so that's a good thing. <laughs> I'm glad we talked about this. Uh, and then we were also talking about like the the nun. I saw the yeah. nun, and like, I love James Wan so much. Like he's Same. one of my favorite directors, probably of all time. Like he's really? so yeah. Wow. Oh yeah, he's like people undervalue horror movie directors. Mm. If you look at Insidious or the mm. original Conjuring, and just look at the camera moves. Oh yeah, he's... look at look at the uh, amount of ambiance he brings. Look at how every single choice is intentional and original. Mm. It's like there's nothing about his work that isn't perfect when he does it. I don't like when he hands off the franchises to other people. Like. That's my main critique with the Saw franchise. The first two, excellent. Then he hands them off and it runs amok. Yeah. Sort of what you're seeing with the Conjuring series. Well, yeah, because since he created himself, you know, and then, uh, you know, having other people, uh, you know, do another one, they don't, they're not quite as artistic, we'll say. Yeah. You know? And they're not very creative with their movies. Because when I was watching The Nun, I kept thinking, man... What I would have done, you know, like all how creative you could you could make it, and not just so by the numbers, formulaic, you know. That. Well, I and the other thing too is with now every James Wan movie has jump scares in it, but he yeah. is so masterful, he, yes. Hitchcockian almost, <laughs> in, in like how he will set up a level of suspense that is terrifying without needing jump scares. Mm-hmm. He d- he's so masterful at it that he like he'll set something up to where you think a jump scare is coming, you sit there in that tension and then it just <laughs> never comes and then you just go, "Oh, it's not coming." And then he'll hit you. Yeah. He knows how to psychologically fuck with the audience and these other and it's so, I mean, it's so insulting to these other directors cuz I'm sure they're working as hard as they can, but yeah, they're trying. Uh, there's something missing. I mean, his, his talent level is just so good. It's almost like he should create a series, let other directors start with it, and then he builds on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because then it wouldn't be so disappointing. It would just be like, oh, it's getting better as it goes. You know, I, I like, too, with him when it comes to horror, I like that he always can build dread. Like, you can always feel that sense of dread in films, yeah. like, insidious. Like, oh, yeah. I was always, 
I, I kept waiting for the, the, you know, something terrible to happen. You just feel that throughout the whole movie. Yeah. Same with The Conjuring, too. And it builds up. That's what I love about The Conjuring. And you care about all the characters. Oh, yeah. Which is one thing I think a lot of horror directors do not get right. Well, that's what was wrong with all those 80s slasher movies, except for Except Halloween. that was the point, though. You know, like with Friday the 13th, we didn't, nobody really cared about the uh, no. victims. They cared about Jason and what he was doing. Which is weird, because it it's is almost weird. like he's an anti-hero character In instead a way, of a yeah. slasher monster. Well, same with Freddy, too. You know, Freddy was another one. Like, I well, yeah. cared a lot about Freddy. I still do. I love, he's probably my favorite slasher. Do you, you know? think Robert England? he says he won't do it again. Do you think he'll do it again? I think if they came up with a really good script and they, you know, wave some money in his face. Do you think Wes would have to direct it? Well, Wes is dead, so... Oh, he's dead? I don't think I knew that, bro. He died, I think, last year, a year or two, yeah. Oh, my God, that's right, he did, wow. Well, I mean... Holy shit, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, that's really too bad. He he was another one, fantastic director. Oh, yeah. Nightmare, Nightmare's probably his best one. What about Scream? No, Scream would be his second best one. What? I think Scream's better than Nightmare. The original Nightmare you're talking? I don't think the original Nightmare was... Okay. So, well, I think it's very creative. And same with Scream. Yeah, Scream's I mean, creative, but too. My favorite of that Freddy Krueger series was uh, his new Nightmare. Uh, you know, I was, I was about to say, because like, they, they already kind of did that. With it was being so like, fucked up because it was like you didn't know what was real world, what was dream yeah. world, what was actor. And that was actor. cool. Yeah, it was so... It was really Like, cool. I don't know. I mean, that dude must have done, like, some fucking mushrooms and wrote that because it's, like, it's so <laughs> twisted. Well, he says uh, he would have bad dreams, and they even incorporated it in the film, too. Oh, that he was having nightmares? Yeah, I, I believe that's what it was. I know uh, when he did the first movie that he was reading articles about children uh, in another country having, night having nightmares, nightmares and, and dying yeah. from them, and that's kind of, that was part of what inspired it. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. That's crazy. Dude, I cannot believe I didn't remember he died. <laughs> it's like a, a Mandela there. effect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially for a guy who's doing a fucking Hollywood, uh, <laughs> Hollywood podcast. Uh, let me introduce you real quick. This sure. is, uh, I'm Stephen Anthony Bailey, your host. You you, you know that. It's, it's episode 13. <laughs> so. Uh, so this is episode 13, uh, oh, wow. and I'm talking to a uh, good buddy of mine, Stephen Vogel. He's How an actor. Doing? Yes. Hello. Uh, glad to have you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, so. I have loosened the reins on what this is, and I'm just like, I just want to talk to people now. It's more cool. fun for me. Yeah. And I don't, like, here's the other thing. I'm sure my listeners are like, great, let's talk to another actor. <laughs> you know, like, uh, it, there's only so much talking about Uta Hagen that you can do without boring people to death. Uh, yeah. So... You know, we'll talk a bit about that. But sure, really, sure. what I, you know, I just kind of want to just shoot the shit, really. I don't yeah. have anything else to do. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, so going back to, like, the the, the horror movie thing, mm-hmm. what, like, what would you say about, like, so who would direct the, if, if they did bring Freddy Krueger back, who do you think would be the right director to do it? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, well, here's what I'll say. If this new Halloween does really well, which I'm really hoping it does. I, I think hope, it will. I think it will, too. I hope Blumhouse uh, can get the rights somehow. Mm. And, I don't know, maybe get David Gordon Green and Danny McBride to do it. I, I, I've noticed that, you know, with those guys and also John Krasinski, that people who are in comedy are now, like, doing horror. Uh, Jordan Peele is another mm-hmm. one, you know? Yeah. So I would say get someone from comedy. Maybe. I think comedians all enjoy horror movies because it's so different. Like, as somebody who does stand-up and stuff, like, it's hard for me to keep watching stand-up all the time (laughs) when you just saw ten comedians in a row do their fucking, you know, Trump bit. Uh, you know, and yeah. then you, you turn it on, and that's everyone's opening joke. You're like, mm. and turn it off. Let's watch, what else is there? And then you stumble into a horror film, which gets you... See, co- comedy films... Let's just let's not even say films. Comedy and horror are very close together. Mm. They're very, very close together because they are both the movies that rely on um, surprise. Mm. And it's a magic trick. To make someone laugh is a magic trick. To scare someone is a magic trick because both things are not real. Mm-hmm. They're both a surprise. <laughs> and it takes somebody who's very masterful at the setup and the punch. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I think they can go back and forth. Whereas, like, if a comedian were to direct, like, 
um, a Queen Elizabeth movie, it'd probably be horrible. <laughs> but I can see very easily that they, these comedi- comedic actors or comedians that are directing these are using what they know and what they're good at inherently, which is a rhythm, which is a, um, a cadence, which is a, 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 the setup and punch, that mm-hmm. it can go back and forth very easily. Yeah. Um, but also, I think it, it goes back to the thing what I said is a, that that's probably what they watch so much that it's it sort of it gets in you, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I think like if anyone wanted to be a stand up comedian, I would say just start going to a lot of shows, watch stand up a lot, listen to stand up a lot because you'll get the the rhythm of how stand up works. Because stand up is you can't just go up there, you know. It's not a knock knock, who's there <laughs> kind of shit. Yeah. It's like you have to lull your audience into following you in one direction, and then the punchline is the turn by surprising mm. them, saying something unexpected. So, I, But the only way to kind of get that is not only to do it. You know, there's classes where you can go do it, and they don't really teach you how to do it. It's just a safe space to do it in, uh, which is good because yeah. you can get a little bit of feedback, like, oh, if you would have said this, it would have turned better or whatever. Right, right. But it's something that you do based upon repetition, repetition, repetition. Gotcha. And so you just have to immerse yourself in it. And I think it's probably the same thing. Like, if if I was going to direct a horror movie, I would just start watching all the great horror movies to kind of feel what works and what doesn't. Because when it doesn't work, everyone knows it. (laughs) I think, uh, you know, one thing that's, like, tough, because I I really want to write some horror because I'm such a big fan. And Mm -hmm. I think one thing that's tough is trying to come up with something that's different or original, you know, without trying to copy anyone you know? Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah. I've, like, um, tried to come up with proper, um, you know, storylines to write with. I'm not necessarily that kind of writer, though. I, I think, you know, with writing, everyone's good at something different. Like, yeah. I'm not necessarily good at writing comedic features for some reason, but I can write you a sketch that is funny in about a half hour. No, like sitting down and doing it. I can bust those out like when, when Vine was a thing or like when I do these little <laughs> video videos. I just kind of come up with them. Yeah, sure. And they just come out. But when it's like, okay, now do that for 90 minutes, I'm like, I don't I don't have a <laughs> plot good enough for that. I can pump <laughs> yeah. these small jokes and it's like, well, how do... You know, so that's not necessarily my forte, but I can sit down and write um, thriller, suspense stuff, uh, action films. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can write drama pretty decently. Uh, and I think that's probably just because I come from reading so much, uh, so many theater plays and um, yeah, of course. things like that. But like everyone's different. So like w- with writing, and this is actually one of my questions for you is like, what writing have you dabbled in, and where do you see your n- inherent natural talent coming through, like genre wise? You know, to be honest, I haven't really written really anything. I'm still in the process of doing that, actually. I always come up with ideas that once I start, you know, typing, sometimes I, you know, I, I, I try to, like, expand off of what my idea is, and then I'm like, nah, I don't, I, that sounds stupid. I don't like that. And then I'll just mm-hmm. stop, you know, and I won't right. go back to it. But there are a few ideas that, I, that I've had that I do like that I will probably, you know, try and uh, dabble in. I would probably say... Um, I'm trying to write some that's like a stylish horror, mm-hmm. and also a action movie that's like, it, in a way, a tribute to the '80s action films. You right. know, where it's mm-hmm. it's very. Uh, so would it be like comedic and sort of tongue in cheek? Yeah, yeah, a little comedic, a little tongue in cheek. I don't, I'd almost want to have like a mix of almost all the genres in a way. That way, it, like it's a little well rounded, but you know, not overstepping any, uh, you know in any of the boundaries where you're kind of questioning what the tone is, like The Predator, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I grew up watching those kind of movies. and uh, So yeah, you you talking to you yeah. uh, outside of this, it, you're you're definitely a movie nerd. Like mm-hmm. you have, it's, it's an, you know, I talk to so many people about movies and there's very few people who kind of ingest as many films as you have. Like mm-hmm. I don't know very many people who have that sort of encyclopedic knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um besides myself. Uh, <laughs> but your, yours is pretty good. So, like, when did you start obsessing over movies? Um, probably when I was five, actually. Mm-hmm. I was five years old, and uh, my mom used to babysit me and a whole bunch of other kids, and she'd always have uh, nap time, but I wouldn't go to sleep. 
So she just put on a movie and then... Freddy Krueger? No, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I did watch movies like that when I was young, you know? Yeah. Freddy. Uh, when I was young, I was watching, like, Terminator 2 and, like, Die Hard. And At that, a way too young age, me too. That's, probably. Yeah, I, I yeah. think I saw... Terminator 2 is one of the first movies I remember seeing. Same, same. And it was... Yeah. I think it, it must have been, because I think it came out in, like, 91, 92. Yeah. Which would have made me, me personally, four or five. Mm-hmm. And I... I don't. Oh, I didn't see it in theaters, but I think I saw it on VHS. So I de- and I definitely was Same. too young, and The Godfather far too young, Scarface far too young. Like oh. I talk about that all the time. I think it was those ultra violent movies. I don't know. I don't think they made me violent. Like that's always no. the debate, right? Like yeah, I all don't. The kid not, sees violence to become violent. No. I think real life violence makes other people violent. Yeah, exactly. Like if if someone does something to you, you want your revenge on them. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's coming from movies. No, cuz movies are art, you know, it's an art form. Correct. Now what with like video games, I, I don't that I can't really speak on cuz I don't really play, but like um, I wouldn't say that either cuz it, I it's it, but do you think like the simulation of actually like pulling the trigger and killing something is no, because the same consciously touching on anything. I mean, I don't think so. It didn't. It didn't do that for me because that's that's another. Are thing. you a it's big gamer? Art. Not a big gamer, but I like. It's funny because I like the games that have like movie storylines. You know, like sure. for instance, like Grand Theft Auto. Mm-hmm. That's a very violent game. Right? Yeah. Well, the the most violent. You yeah. Could argue. Yeah, and I'm not violent because of that. You know, it's just I I like I like it as an art form. Right. You know. Yeah. So I think. Well, it is, and I mean, it, it it's, is. Yeah. It makes. Did you know that the video game industry makes more money? Than the film industry, music industry combined. I feel like, yeah, they make I so can, much money, and they yeah, under, like sense. all these designers are so underpaid. <laughs> oh wow! They, they're not, you know, they're selling these games for sixty dollars a pop. Yeah, and they're selling millions of copies of each one. Mm-hmm. And a designer will come on there and work on it. They're not. They don't receive royalties. They're not union. If we do a movie as an actor, we're going to receive. You know, if your contract's right, you're going to receive. <laughs> Royalties, points on the back end, right? Yeah. Uh, and you you have a union that'll back you up and make sure you're getting paid a certain wage and make sure all these things are in place, right? They're not union. And, like, it's very... Like, our country's very interesting with, like, unions. Like, mm-hmm. um, they're not looked upon as positively as they used to be. Yeah. You know, um... I don't know. Like, even with, like, SAG, like, everyone thinks, like, when they join SAG, they're going to get work. And it's like, that's <laughs> actually the opposite of what happens. Their job isn't to get you work, which is unfortunate. Yeah. That, that you know, because there's so many SAG members. In fact, I think they need to tighten the reins up because there's so many members that were joining based upon, like, the new media agreement. Mm-hmm. Which is a great thing because that's how I got in. But now that I'm in, I'm one. Of, that's how this is how capitalism works. As soon as you get on the other side, you're like, and that's enough. It cuts <laughs> off with me. I don't know what that psychology is, but you just feel like you become selfish because you understand that even though you're in that club, you're not getting what the people that were there before you were, have gotten. I see. You know, you're yeah. still in line. Right. You just get to be in like the cooler line, and you don't want it. But you know that anyone who gets in even behind you, you have to share with them. <laughs> So, so is it, it like being at Disneyland and getting the fast pass? Yeah, in a way. Okay. In a way, but like <laughs> only there's no ride. Oh, like you know, like there's you still have to like, damn it, trick your way into it. Like, and I definitely like, and this will go. I'm gonna turn this to you because sure. you've been able. You booked two features. Yes, and you know, you've been able to like build your career. Uh, it, you booked them. What am I trying to say? You booked them very close together. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, and that's like it's such a incredible thing that there's so many of these non-union features being made that are like giving actors work, and they don't even have to worry about the union. Yeah, you don't have to pay your union dues twice a year. Mm-hmm. You don't have to, um, you know, worry about voting and keeping the the union going in the direction that you want it to. You don't have to worry about like. Um, not doing non-union work or else you'll get in trouble kind of thing. You can just kind of act and just worry about being an actor. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know what the benefit of joining SAG anymore is because especially being here in L.A., we're fourth place. Mm. We're fourth place. I believe it's... uh, I don't know the order, but I know New York, 
Atlanta and Vancouver wow. are filming more than we are here. That's crazy. It's stupid. Yeah. The movie capital of the world, nothing's being filmed here. It, it, the, and insane. it's the union's job to get the work here. Yeah. And, you know, I think to myself, we're paying these dues and they're getting cuts of my royalties, all this stuff like that. We're, and what are they doing for me? Like, what have you done for me lately? I, you know, I don't, I don't really understand sort of, you know, how to win the game anymore. Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess it's really not about that anymore. I guess it's just playing it, not so much just winning it, just playing the game. And I don't even know by, what that is, By though, playing you know? that, it's like it has nothing to do with creating a career that gives you a living wage anymore. It's just like, do you enjoy acting? Well... It, it's almost like we've come back to what acting used to be of, like, these paupers who put on shows in the middle of the courtyard. Yeah. You know, like, back in those Victorian days of theater kind right. of thing, where, like, it's just these this tr- these troops of actors who live together, sort of, you know... And that's how, like, the actor studio got started back when they were the group theater. They all lived together in sort of this compound, mm-hmm. and they would share everything socialism style, you know, like everyone gets their cut and everyone gets a role and everyone does their part. Right. But they weren't rich people. So by the time they like graduated out of it and they were on Broadway and they still weren't making any money. And then so they would break apart from that and go try to get film careers and things like that Mm -hmm. now that they've got these Broadway credits. But they weren't making money doing that. They had to live on very, very little to keep that group together. Oh, man. Isn't that wild? Yeah. And I think that's what we're going to have to go back to because there's just so many people who want to be actors and, you know, not enough work. No, yeah, and that's a problem. You know, and I I think one thing that kind of sucks is uh, for actors, you know, who aren't big on social media, they're the ones, you know, not getting a lot of work. You know, the ones who are very heavy on social media are getting a lot of work. Well, yeah. Because of their presence, you know. Absolutely. I mean, well, look, there's a reason I take every opportunity to use the internet. And that's, you know, like, how do you, how do you personally feel about like your output on with, with the internet and your relationship with it as an entertainer? Well, I mean, when I, when I use social media, I mean, what I'm doing right now is just, I will post any monologues or auditions or say photos, headshots, anything that's acting related, I'll post. Right. You know? I don't have a YouTube channel or, you know, I'm doing a show or anything like that, you know, because I know there's some people doing that, which is cool. Um, how come How come that's not a thing for you? Why, why are you not doing that? I don't know. I, I just, I feel like it'll, it'll take, it'll, you know, take my attention away from, you know, trying to book jobs, you know, and maybe I should look into doing something on YouTube, but I don't know. I feel like if I, if I, if it ends up, say, taking off, ends up being really good, then I feel like I'm just going to get stuck there and I like it too much. It's like it's like someone once told me, like, you know, you do extra work, you get paid right now, but sometimes when you do it a lot, you get so used to that culture that that's just what you do, which is the extra that's work. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And and you do get... That's why I've always tried to... And I've been critiqued. People always want to give you advice kind mm-hmm. of thing, but, like, which is appreciated, but I get critiqued for... Um, not following the rules as well. Mm. Um, But at the same time, I'm very, like, I am all over the place, for sure. Uh, But I've been able to do so many fun things. Like, look at this little podcast. I'm I'm able to, like, (laughs) sit down and still be creative. We're shooting the shit, talking about things that we would want to talk about anyway. Taking time out to, like, hang out with you and and making a product out of it and yeah. some of these questions like I have time to sit and I make myself sit down and think of these questions that I want to ask you and we talk all the time we work together mm-hmm. uh, we'll get to that in a little bit uh, <laughs> but like you know we, we shoot the shit but like to actually take time out to do this and keep it creative is very fun yeah. uh, I'm not doing this thing to get rich I'd like it if it started making yeah, it would but be cool, uh, huh? wouldn't that be great <laughs> uh, but um, but I like that I've diversified myself between like a podcast, a YouTube channel. I do features. That's I'm great. trying to get more TV. You know, I'm I do my classes. I do theater. I do the stand up. I'm all over the place because I don't want to be stuck as like 
Uh, what's that kid's name? He's on YouTube. He did the boxing match a couple weeks ago. Logan Paul. Oh. The kid who, with yeah. the Japanese that thing, guy. that kid. Uh, he, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't quite get it. Uh, and maybe it's based upon a uh, different generational gap or something like that. Mm-hmm. But, like, I don't know, I don't get the appeal. And I'm not hating on his hustle. Good for him because he's made a shitload of money. Yeah, yes. And I know he studies at with Anthony Mendel, who's an amazing uh, uh, acting yeah. teacher. And That's so, right. like, he, I know he's done that. I know that, you know, he puts a lot of work in because he's made hundreds and He's probably over a thousand videos on his YouTube channel. It's crazy. It's incredible. Yeah. And, but I, I do think though that he's branded and he's gotten to do a couple of movies. I know the people who do movies with him and they're talented people and they, you know, they would pick social media stars to act in their films. Mm-hmm. These aren't real actors. No. They're not actors that are that have done it for years and years and done all these plays and studied and studied and studied. They're just exactly. people who like are kind of messing with it, messing with it, messing with it. And just a personality. Really. A personality, yeah, right. Yeah. A certain type, but there's they, they don't have a craft. No. No. Now, that's an insult for sure, but what I will say again is I respect the hustle. My point is is that it it does diminish the art form. Yes. It hurts it. and it But the good thing is is that someone like him will always be looked at as just he's just a YouTube personality it's he's true. not an actor he'll never yeah. be looked at as an actor even if he does 30 movies compared to an actor who only does 20 but is doing plays and shit I still say the guy who's doing the plays and doesn't have as many movies but has a craft is the actor he's the actor and yeah. he's still the YouTube personality now that sounds like sour grapes but at the same time I think and especially here in LA there is a lack of of respect for like building a craft around this and putting the time in. There's a laziness. Yeah. There's a there's a lottery ticket mentality, a get rich quick scheme mentality out here, and it makes me fucking sick. Well, those are the ones who just want to be celebrities. Yeah, they don't they don't care about the art form. Right. No, those people are insulting. You know. Yeah, right. they are. Um, how much time do you just put into your uh, into your acting, like on a Let's break it down from, like, a daily basis and then a weekly basis. Like, what's a, a typical day for you on the grind trying to get this to become uh, more uh, continuous uh, income? Well, every day I always uh, uh, submit on L.A. Casting or Actors Access. Mm-hmm. Same. Um, oh, every day, always do that. Um you know, I watch movies too. I, I'll watch it not just for entertainment, but I'll just watch it to watch acting. Mm-hmm. They get inspired. I think that's one thing that I I haven't had lately is inspiration from, you know, actors who are out there working. Because I remember my biggest inspiration and what made me move out here was watching uh, Heath Ledger as the Joker in The Dark Knight. Because that. I mean, that performance just blew my mind. Can you do a couple lines from the monologue? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you want to know how I got these scars? See, my father was a drinker and a fiend. And <laughs> That's pretty good. That's yeah, pretty thank good. You, thank That's, you. It's, it's really good. Like, it, it, like, I looked away from you as you were doing it because it's creepy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's really good. Um... So, yeah, having a lack of inspiration is definitely a problem. What do you do to, like, mix that up to, like, try to get it back besides watching I'll read great books. performances? I have books that I, that I... Which books do you read? Well, I just got the Jenna Fisher book. That's a great book. It is. I was heavily inspired by that after that and made me, like, even push even harder. Yeah. You know? It's a great book. She, it's amazing. Her writing that is... She's so real, which is what I yeah. love. And she's so, she like... She doesn't bullshit She connects, you. too. I have been dabbling because you I think you know I do that actors vlog thing where I try to give advice to beginning actors yeah I put that on YouTube that's great well at the same time I and I also I like this little blog it sounds like I'm plugging myself I'm not I just want to kind of get to a point here mm-hmm. but I have this blog where I would write like little articles about acting at, and all these lessons that I'm learning by constantly making mistakes mm-hmm. and um, 
so I have this idea for this book called More Time Acting. Mm. Uh, because when I first started out, I read everything. Self-management for actors, how to break into the acting business, how to get work in L.A., whatever the fuck the title <laughs> of the book was. That's great. I read everything. And yeah. guess what? They were all bullshit. It was all wrong. It was all like, just get headshots and submit to agents with envelopes. It's yeah, like, this stuff that. is so outdated. Yeah. They were written by actors who weren't really in the game. They were written by actors who, like, it felt like somebody came in for to L.A. for a week, asked around, how do you get work, took some notes, took and notes sold and a, book a book for $30 <laughs> a pop. If I, if I When I finish this book, I'm not going to be charging that much. I'm going to charge as little as possible mm-hmm. to where I can still... Uh, have a couple of dollars coming in the publisher can get a couple of dollars but keep it cheap for actors and that's why I put it for free on YouTube that's why I put my blog out for free that's, that's why I'm making this is because this information should not be a secret no. it's so hard to chase your dreams anymore especially in this profession that that information should absolutely be coming from somebody who's really in the trenches like going through it Making the mistakes, realizing what works and what doesn't, especially in the time of the internet where everything is consistently changing and evolving and turning into something so different. Yeah. If you time traveled an actor from, if you brought James Dean back to life from <laughs> 1954 and dropped him in the middle of LA today, I don't know that he would get work. I don't think so either. I think it would take a, a really long time. A really long time. Yeah. And, uh, You know, because, I mean, that dude was making money in New York off of doing these live TV plays. They would rehearse them for a week and put them up. Yeah. And, you know, he might only make a couple hundred dollars, but that would help pay his rent, keep him in a a roof over his head, and, and, you know, keep him him auditioning for other things. Exactly, yeah. You know, uh, everyone, I hate, I cannot stand the legend that people portray him as because no one's really done the research on him that they say, oh, he did three feature films. Okay, that's not all he did. Like that's he didn't just come to Hollywood and do uh, East of Eden. Like that's not what happened. Yeah. He, you know, he, it ju- it drives me bonkers. It's like they don't realize he was in theater school, and they don't realize all the plays he did, and that he was doing everything he could. He was like a, a security guard at the CBS parking lot just to try to meet people. He was doing, you know, if you look up his IMDb, he's got like fifty acting credits. And not to mention off-Broadway plays, being part of the actor's studio, studying his ass off, and that's not the only place he studied. He started in L.A., moved to New York, came back to L.A. He had to wrestle and figure out how to make it work. Now, he was so ambitious and such a hungry worker that he was able to do it, but he also was very good at like networking and meeting the right people, and, yeah. and he, he was an opportunist when it came to that. People don't see that struggle, they, they, and they still think... They think it worked that way back then, and they think it works that way now. Mm. So people who, and I wonder if you go through this too, people who are from your hometown look at you and go, so um, you're not that big yet. What's going on? <laughs> like, I've, I've been working. Like, yeah. I've, I've actually gotten projects made. What the hell are you talking about? Like, that's yeah. a miracle. That's a miracle to get anything happening, to get a job Playing pretend mm-hmm. is a miracle. Oh, yeah. Do you feel that from your hometown? You know, I don't have people who say that to me, thankfully. Yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, yet. No, but I do have, uh, like, my, like, my theater friends from college mm-hmm. who I still talk to here and there. And any time they see, I, you know, I book something, they just they, they get so happy for me because they know. They know that the, uh, being out here is a struggle because there's so many people out here trying to do it, mm-hmm. you know. So luckily for now... I don't have anybody who's saying that to me right now. Right. Thank God. Yeah. Um, I always yeah. like. I always <laughs> wonder about that too. I'm like, am I going to get somebody who's going to say that to me? And I'm like, what am I going to say? Well, it's say? so hurtful. I, you it know is, what? You don't is. say anything. You, you know, I've had a lot of criticism come at me oh. over over my time here. I'm I'm over seven years here. I've had people say things like, "There, you know, there's a lot of I get a lot of jealousy." Uh, I've been jealous as well. I talk about that all the time. I've been jealous of all these people that I see around me that I I know personally that are fortunate enough to work pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. And it's hard not to let that hurt your soul. Well, it's a natural thing as a human being. Totally. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I get that way too. You see, especially if you feel that it comes a bit easier for them. 
right? Oh yeah. Because yeah. and that's gonna happen. That's just gonna happen. And that's and you have to realize like it hit me like a ton of bricks that that is okay. It took a long time, but it was like that's okay because those that career path was not the career path I came out here to do anyway. Mm-hmm. Those those weren't roles that I could play. Those weren't things that I should be doing. Those were, that wasn't that w- it wasn't my time to do that. And it's like exactly. it sounds like you're making excuses to make yourself feel better, but you nope. have to really look at it honestly and see that nope, now's not the time yet. That's I'm the biggest thing that I go by is now is not the time. Cause, and I'll tell you, because um, I like to watch um, biography on actors that I like mm-hmm. because that's also inspiring. Yeah, totally. I was watching uh, George Clooney, and uh, yep. he struggled for the longest time. They said in the eighties, like you know, he was doing pilots that just failed. Mm-hmm. He was doing these movies that failed. I would love to do a pilot that failed. Right, me that just job. just to do it, right? Yeah, and then uh, yeah, just to because he it wasn't like it wasn't like he was. Not working at all, but no, he, he was just couldn't yeah. be. He wasn't. He wasn't big. No, it, it didn't pop. And they said uh, part of the problem during the '80s was that it was during the time of the big muscle Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Van mm-hmm. Damme kind of time. What does Arnold Schwarzenegger sound like? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. If he were to watch this Predator movie, like, what the fuck was that? What is this? this? Is stupid. Who made this piece of shit? Oh no! What's what's that line from Predator? He's like, it's it's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It. <laughs> God, I love Schwarzenegger. I I told you this the other day. I would pay so much money to see Arnold and Donald Trump do a celebrity boxing oh, match. Oh yes, I would uh, love to see that because I I love any time Trump does something and then Arnold makes a video in retaliation. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Oh, this man. is nonsense. It's one of my favorite feuds that's going on. I love that he didn't totally shake his accent. Like, his accent is not as thick as it was in, coach. like, Pumping Iron. Did you know that he has a coach? He has a dialect coach. Yeah. That helps him keep, keep it. it. Uh, I think I think that's great because if you think about it, if his, his accent brand. changed. Yeah, but if it changed. If he sounded like you right now, I'd be like, And he mm, said, I'll be back. Like, I, that, that doesn't sound cool. I will be back. Get to the chopper. <laughs> that doesn't sound cool either. Get to down. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, actually. Come it, with me if you want to live. Please get down. <laughs> Will you come with me? Because I know you want to live. I'm pumping iron. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love how much, like, if you look at him in pumping iron and then you see how much plastic surgery he got, like he had a mole did he? that he, yeah, dude, he got his I, teeth fixed, he had a mole taken off, he had his like jaw reconstructed. Wait, did he fix the space between his teeth? Pretty much, yeah. Really? And then he got wow. his jaw reconstructed because he had an underbite, and then he, look, if you look wow. at him in Terminator 2, he looks, his bone structure turns into godlike bone structure. <laughs> and then if you look at him pumping <laughs> well, he's iron, he's sort of like, <laughs> you know, he just looks like a normal dude with all these muscles. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, but facially, it looks like a normal like dude. Like in Hercules in New York. Exactly, that was pre... So he started getting that... But did you know, like, he was rich before he got successful? No, I didn't know that. I he thought was he, a I real estate mogul. He a poor family. He oh. did, but he came here and, like, he all he did was work and hustle and work and hustle. Damn. And he invested his money. He I think he owned an apartment complex. And he had over a million dollars in the bank before he was... And that's... Jesus. So you have that much money when you're coming to Hollywood and you have then money to throw around. You can... Well, you got time to, like, you know, audition like crazy, too. Yeah, you had that audition money. Audition and buy the right headshots and whatever else he was doing. Man. Uh, wow. but And then it helped that he earned his a lot of his fame from being, you know, Mr. Well, Universal. You know, I, I, the thing... Arnold is so inspiring. His story. Mm-hmm. Like, everything he said he'd do, he did. Yeah. And that is, like, one of the most inspiring things ever, like... Yeah. I wonder what does, do you think he's still what are his goals now do you think probably doesn't you know what maybe he's I think he's trying to make a comeback he's still trying to make a comeback ever since you know getting out of governor like he's, he's had just, so many flops it's for just films. so I'm such a big fan of him yeah Same. there's so many flops and like He's an old man now. He's, it, it's not. It's I not feel the bad same even anymore. talking about him like this. But he's yeah. an old man. He doesn't have the body he had. No, he's trying to get it back. I've, it, I've seen it, his videos. He's trying. I know. I know, but like the skin is an organ on the body, and once it reaches a certain age and it doesn't have the elasticity anymore, he's the just, muscle density isn't going to come back. Even if he is pumping himself full of uh, steroids, it's not going to come out the right way. He's just going to look kind of like gross <laughs> you know i don't think i mean 
I don't know how you feel. You, you probably might agree, but I don't think he should have stopped acting to be a governor. I think he he fucked himself like that. I, the same way Mickey Rourke fucked himself by becoming a boxer. Yeah. And Mickey Rourke was trying to make a comeback, and he had that one comeback, and then he fucked it all up because he ran Yeah, I guess he's still sort of working, but he's not sort of. on top. I don't know, like, no. I mean, you know, The Wrestler was so good. The Wrestler was amazing. Yeah. like, And then, you know, he did... What was it? He uh, did Iron Man Iron 2. Man too? He did yeah. Expendables. And, you know, you've seen Seven Psychopaths, right? I haven't seen that yet. No. Okay. He was supposed to be in that movie. He was supposed to be Woody Harrelson's part. Oh, okay. And he turned it down, or he just, like, he left last minute because he said Martin McDonough was a jerk-off. Oh. And I'm like, okay. Um, probably not a good thing to say. No. Because uh, that was the beginning of the end for him. Yeah, you you can't you can't say that you can't. If you're that. gonna bow out of something, just say creative differences and yeah. shut your mouth. Yeah, because it's fine to have creative differences. It happens totally. It happens, it happens all, all the, time. the time. Yeah, it's yeah. a weird time we live in, man. It between really like, is. you know, I was thinking about that. Like, what? I don't know. I feel a, a strong responsibility to leave this world better than I came into it oh, you know course, what I mean yeah. and that's that's very difficult to do it's very difficult to change the world it's very difficult to, to help but all you can do is like just do your best every single day do your part yeah do your part yeah, yeah. like I was I was talking uh, to a buddy of mine we were talking about you know um, in Australia they have a law where everyone must vote or oh. you get a fine oh and yeah. so <laughs> I, I, I was talking to that with him and he was like well I don't agree with that and I was like well, what's not to agree with why do you, why, you know, I mean, just go vote. It takes 10 minutes. And then you're helping your country by speaking your mind and helping create a better country mm-hmm. that reflects who we are as a society. Mm-hmm. And you won't have to pay the fine if you just go vote. Yeah. And then you'll, it's, it's, a, it's a win-win. There's, there's no negative to that. And the people who aren't voting based upon laziness or ignorance or whatever it is, they give money that goes into whatever the programs that those tax dollars would go to. Mm-hmm. Education, health care, whatever. But I, I think that's very important. I mean, but most people... I know so many people that don't vote. It, it breaks yeah. my heart and drives me crazy. Do you vote? Are you voting? Um, I didn't vote this last one. Um, yeah. For the... For the you mean the, the 16? 2016? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't vote. Are you going to vote for a midterms, do you think? I'll do, Yeah. Um. Well, this the 2016 election was very difficult. Like it was. How <laughs> my parents didn't even vote. Yeah, like, it was that. I hard. think a lot of people didn't. Yeah. But I, I I think that they didn't want the responsibility. They didn't want the blood on their hands. Cause yeah, it's a hard decision to make. You know. Well, you know, we we a two party society. You know, if some, <laughs> it, it's like you know. Um, I don't even have an analogy for it because it's so hard. I was gonna say Walmart or what else? Like Walmart Target. is obviously Walmart or Target. There you go. <laughs> like I would vote for Target. It's still a big box store, but they seem to treat their employees a bit better. Their product seems to be a bit better. Um, I was I was also thinking with this last one. I was like, oh, who do you want to vote for, Emperor Palpatine or Lord Voldemort? <laughs> but then someone said, well, Palpatine. You know, he ran the empire. I'm like, yeah, true, true. So he yeah. did. Did have something with that because the people in the empire, those those stormtroopers or whatever, you know, they they were making a wage. Yeah, they were. Now, how did they send their wages back to their families? Like, and also, <laughs> all the stormtroopers seem to look the same. Did the, all the stormtroopers come from the same planet? Was it a multi-planetary grouping of employees working on the dust? Well, if we're going by prequels, then it's clones, right? Isn't that what it was? Oh, the clones. Yeah. The clones. If we want to count the prequels, right. So some Elon Musk type figure created the clones <laughs> in the Star Wars universe in this alternate timeline. Elon Musk, Jango Fett, you know, same, <laughs> same thing. thing. Same <laughs> thing. Right? In Star Wars world, I guess. Oh man, but yeah, you're right, man. Like it was, it was very difficult. And, like I voted for Bernie first. Yeah. Right, and yeah. then I wound up obviously voting for Hillary. Um, and it was a, it, it was. It was even tough for me to pick between Bernie and Hillary because I really wasn't completely sold on either one of them. Mm-hmm. But then when it's obviously between 
old Donny boy and, and Hillary, I, I chose Hillary, obviously. Obviously. Now everyone's like, you know, she's a criminal and this and that. And like, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get into conspiracy theory yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on this podcast, but like, yeah. you know, no politician is innocent. You know, the most uh, squeak clean one, there's dirt to be dug. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it's such a tough, tough climate. You know, I don't, I don't know. And let's switch this back to a positive thing. Sure. I, I tried thinking to myself yesterday with a little thought experiment. Like, what is the future of acting? What is the future? Damn. Because in the climate we live in, with the Internet still making changes, I think most of the changes are made. I still think there's change to come and more mm-hmm. infrastructure to be presented. Mm-hmm. Because the TV... I heard uh, Gary Vayner- Vaynerchuk. Have you heard of this guy, Gary V? He's a YouTube personality, mm-hmm. uh, but very motivational uh, entrepreneur. Oh, that's guy. Good. That's good. So I heard him talking about how when the TV, the television, the original television was invented, people had radios, and they would listen to radio plays in their house, right? Mm-hmm. So then everybody gets a TV. Guess what they stopped doing? They stopped listening to the radio. Right. Okay. Now everyone's got TVs in their house, but now we have phones and laptops, So there's a divide. Mm -hmm. Also, on those TVs, people are streaming from Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, HBO Go, smart TV, everything, right? right? Yeah. And so, who's watching the the major networks live? You might, you could, and especially with like things like a, what's that recording thing? Um, DVR, you like DVR things? Yeah. Um, very few people are watching things live anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, I think a majority of people are, especially, like, people older than us. But that's what I'm saying is time will kind of change things. But yeah. I think, like, YouTube is going to continue to grow and actually give more infrastructure to be more of a an independent sort of distributor than it is. Because right now it's that. still very, very messy. Yeah. YouTube is so messy it's it's irritating to me. There's no real, like I said, infrastructure to be, like, there should be a button to click to be like, I'm looking for web series. And, like, there's a page with a categorization of web series. Like, are you looking for an independent web series? Or are you looking for it to be comedic? Like, there should be tools to click on to be able to be more organized with YouTube. But right sure. now, it's like everyone's just uploading shit. And it's like, unless you know what you're looking for with a few keywords, you're not going to find it. Yeah. And then their suggestion algorithm is still... Stupid. Well, they do. They do have categories now, I believe. Like what they've got, like entertainment on there. Right, but it's they, still. But a then catch-all. again, it's a lot of stuff. It's right? a catch-all, you man. Really narrow and it then, down. Yeah, and I don't know. Like you know, obviously, like the verified profiles. Like if you click entertainment, the Jimmy Fallon viral clips are going to pop up. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then what does entertainment mean? What does it mean? True. Late night TV shows that are putting their viral videos up. Do mm-hmm. they mean? those skateboard videos where people are falling and busting their nuts? Like, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> like, it's still sloppy when it comes to that. A little too general. A little too general. Yeah. Little, not enough... Yeah, just not enough... And, you know, I know they're trying to do, like, the YouTube... What is it? Like, YouTube Red or whatever with their, like... Yeah. What, with the Doing t- a premium TV sort of... shows that yeah. they have on... Yeah. Which yeah. is fine, but also, like, it... I don't know. Like, it just doesn't feel like it's completely put together yet which yeah. is amazing to me because it's it's getting like it's still a new idea but it's it's also an old idea <laughs> you know what I mean like it came out when I was in high school do you remember when uh, YouTube used to not have ads back in the day yeah oh yeah. man I miss those times <laughs> yeah yeah I, I appreciate that for like big. people who you know like and the monetization is is changing yeah um, they're making it harder more difficult. And I think that's a good thing, but also a bad thing. Mm. Like, I like the idea that it's a very entrepreneur-friendly site. Yeah. Like, you could start your web series or whatever you want to start on your YouTube channel, Mm -hmm. keep making them, build your following, monetize monetize it, and create a, a living. Like, there's so many people just doing, like, makeup tutorials. And they yeah, just do one that. a week. Yeah. Build up a following. Millions of girls watch it. Mm-hmm. They get they they'll sit through the five seconds of YouTube ads, skip it, click the pop up down, mm-hmm. 
and then that person's making, you know, Shannon's got a, a friend of hers, I think she went to school with or something, has a giant house, hired her whole family to work for her. Wow. Just doing, like, makeup tutorials. Wow. It's incredible. Damn. Um, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. So I think that's going to continue. Like, what do you... Th- Going back to your answer, because I keep cutting you off, what do you think is the, uh, <laughs> what is the future of acting? That's a good question. I don't know. I haven't really thought about that. Because uh, I can tell you one thing for sure is that with what they're doing now, they can bring back stars who are dead. It's like Yeah, they, how do you feel about that? I don't know. I don't like it. I think it's, I'm, especially, you know, it, there was that Star Wars where they, they brought Peter Cushing back. Uh-huh. And they just all they did was hire a guy who can do an impression of his voice, and it's like, what about that actor? You know, like that the actor himself. It's, I wouldn't want them doing that to me. No, because no. it represents part of my body of work. And down the road, if somebody looked at my body of work and watched that, and let's say they gave a terrible performance with my likeness. <laughs> It's a it's damaging to my body work. Yeah, it's I'm not a puppet. Could you imagine that? Like you see a breakdown on LA casting, and it says uh, uh, James Dean impersonator for some film, or uh, you know yeah. Stephen Bailey impersonator. I don't know. Like that would be terrible if that's where it came to. Where it's just like we're not taking any more new actors. We're just going to reuse the ones that we had throughout the years and. <laughs> That there is suck. that fear, isn't there, that yeah. eventually they're not going to need us anymore. Like, yeah. are we going, going <laughs> the way of, like, everything else with automation and the digital age? And, like, you know, that's that's the fear. Like, you know, like, okay, so we we met each other working at our survival job, which mm-hmm. is at the working for the Green Siren. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're both talking about this, and I think I had this conversation with you about, like, it is a very people person to person connecting connective um, service, mm-hmm. but it doesn't need to be. No, I can easily see there being automation for creating a latte because <laughs> you and I both know a lot of shitty lattes go out because oh, yeah. some baristas don't know how to Especially correctly the ones make who the are phone. New. Yeah, the they, ones they're are new. Trained. Whatever. I mean, or it, you know they. Want specific, very specific, like you know, uh, bone dry mm-hmm. cappuccino. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not for some people. It's not an easy thing to do. So if you had, no. say, uh, would you say an automated yeah just service? Like a, if you had a, something a like that, or or even uh, I, I even thought about that too. Like you now see at restaurants, they have that little uh, um, what it looks like an iPad at the each yeah. table. You mm-hmm. know, you can just order your food and pay right there. Pretty soon, yeah. they're just going to have just things carrying out your food, right? Not people. You know, I feel like that could happen. Technology taking over. It's going to be Terminator 2. Dude, I'm telling you. Apple it's, is Skynet. It's, uh, it's not the first time I've had this conversation, I'll tell you that. I, it, you know, uh, I think Shannon's about sick of me, you know, talking <laughs> about this. I had this uh, experience with her. <laughs> I was in uh, Turks and Caicos this is a couple months ago, mm. and uh, I was out in the sun all day. And we went to one of those all-inclusive resort kind of things. Oh, so I, I was fried. <laughs> and so we all got back to the to the house, and I was in the pool by myself. And I was on uh, one of those floaty raft things, you know, <laughs> looking up at the stars. And because it's Turks, there's less light pollution, so I'm seeing all these stars. And I just felt like, you know, I could travel through them, like you know, like I was so I was so fried. So Shannon comes down, and she's like, "You should come upstairs. It's like two in the morning." Dude, I was so fried. I was just going on and on about simulation theory to her. Yeah. I was like, this is all the simulation. All the simulation. <laughs> and I was just like, I, I was like hammered, right? And oh, like, man. Part of me knew what I was saying. It's the Matrix. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, there is a... Simulation theory is so interesting because it's totally viable. Yeah. It's total. It makes complete sense to me. Yeah. Um, and people could take that as I don't believe in God or anything. In fact, I do believe in God because God would be the creator of the simulation. There you go. That's and and you could argue that that's what the Christian version of life is. Like, isn't that a simulation? Because after you do the test of life, you go get to go to the next level, mm-hmm. right? Or whatever you want to say. Like, I don't think it's an offensive. It's like the least offensive. 
theory of life. But to me, it makes the most sense. I see. Because, like, that's the main question that everyone has is what is what 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 the hell are we doing here? Why yeah. are, why are we why What's are we purpose? living? Why are we doing this? Yeah. Which is why we have to attribute like like I said purpose to our life. I'm an actor. Mm-hmm. I entertain people. That is mm-hmm. my job on this planet is to keep everyone entertained so uh, they can go through their jobs and provide service to each other and so the really smart folks can uh, push technology forward and things like that. I mean. I don't think there will ever be a time when entertainment isn't important. No, it'll it'll always be there. I think I think we'll always be needed. It's and just, I, I think No, go ahead. Go do ahead. you think like CGI will it already has. I mean I don't know how you can evolve CGI even more than what it is now. And the only person who has evolved CGI was uh, to me has been James Cameron. Cuz What's Avatar? Avatar, I mean T two, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, obviously, like George Lucas's, uh, what is it? Uh, what's his company? That does oh, all the THX. No, oh, no, 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 you're. Uh, oh, what the hell is it called? Sky In- Industrial Light. Oh, Industrial Light and Sound. Yeah, is that what it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, those guys with all the money and that did all the science fiction movies. Definitely. You know what I would want? I would want us to. Take down CGI a little bit more and go back to doing more practical, practical. Effects. or Dude, just blend them. You're you're speaking my language. I'm pretty sure I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I'm such a huge proponent of that. Same, because that's one of the reasons why I love Mad Max Fury Road is there's very little CGI, and he, George Miller did a lot of stunts. And one thing that irks me so much when I watch films is when a, when a filmmaker is so lazy that they have to do CGI blood. I'm like Come or CGI on. Um, smoke when they're smoking a cigarette that or too. CGI breath when it's cold. It's, it's I can just always lazy. tell, and I'm always super super annoyed. It's, it takes it, me right out of it. Yeah, it's so lazy, and I and I I like drops a point out of ten for the film. I'm like, well, no matter how good this is, it's now a nine. Yeah, it'll never be a perfect film because of this bullshit. That's how I felt uh, when it comes to the blood. You know, when I watch uh, the Expendables with uh, Stallone and all those guys, and anytime they shoot somebody, I just see CG blood. I'm just like, really? Yeah, really? Like, come on, man! Like, uh, like the films you you you've done, you know, has always been practical blood. Why are you getting lazy all of a sudden? And, and I think when, when it comes to those movies, he's spending more money on the actors he can get. Right, because, well, and the, it, part of that is not his fault. Part of yeah. that is the, the, the studio saying, hey, we need to make this much money off this for to give you that much money to make the movie. He's so, like, okay, well, let's get uh, Mel Gibson. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and just bring in anybody he can. Like, there's no reason you need ten star names in a movie. Well, especially if you're not going to give them any time to like actually do anything, and they're just there just to be there. Like, why was Harrison Ford in Expendables 3? Do you remember Arnold's first thing when he was in the church or whatever? Oh. He was walking through? Yeah. That was so stupid. It's it like, why? It was. It was you, very... you, you, like, you... I get the idea of the tease, but ugh. Ugh. Yeah, that... Yeah. Well... I don't think that you know, CGI is going to put us out of business entirely. No. I do, however, think that theater, live theater, will eventually become more of a novelty. That'd be great. Because everyone's watching their stuff at home. Mm-hmm. Netflix is like the king of creation right now. Oh, yeah. Netflix is what Warner's... It, it is what the studios used to be. Um, I do think that the time of, like, stars making crazy, crazy money is over. <laughs> uh, just because the budgets are going to remain low because they need to. They need to keep a low overhead in order to make it profitable mm. unless they suddenly start jacking up the prices of Netflix <laughs> and Hulu and Which all that. Which is possible. It is possible, and it probably will happen. Uh, we are in a sweet spot now where they're still keeping the prices low to get more and more customers into it. I and then once no one everybody's, Netflix hears this. <laughs> uh, they, they don't need to hear it. I, I think they're, they're pretty smart folk. They know, how, they know how to make the money. About it. Yeah, they definitely have. Um... <laughs> Well, let's go back because uh, we've been all over the place, which again is fine. But let's let's go back. Let's sure. uh, so tell me about your folks, my parents. Yep, your your parental figures. My parentals. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. What would you like to know about them? There's Stuff. so much about you them. know, like uh, where are they from originally? Are they both from 
California? Yeah, they're both California. from California. California. Yeah, they're both from California. Um, yeah, my my dad is a satellite engineer. My mom works for Apple. She's a project manager over there, and she also manages a few of the buildings in the in the Bay Area, which is cool. Um, my dad used to act when he was younger, which is funny. That's that's where I probably got it from. He used to he used to be in the uh, the paper because they always talk about his performances and. He told me that his teacher told him, he's like, you should, you should go to L.A. and pursue this uh, full time. And he was like, no, he didn't want to do it. He, he, didn't, he didn't want to make that big leap. So in a way, I feel like I'm kind of like picking up where he left off, you know, mm-hmm. which is really cool. But uh, they're the ones who both got me into like the movies. They kind of created the uh, movie monster, we'll say. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm really close with them. And I'm so thankful to have them because they're the ones who are, you know, making sure that I'm still out here pursuing this. And they believe in me and that that's really all I need. As yeah. long as they believe in me, you know, that's and as well as myself. But that's the biggest thing is having two supporters like them. I believe in you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank uh, you. What, town, what town are you from originally? I'm from Milpitas in the Bay Area. It's a small little city in between San Jose and Fremont. Nobody really knows that, so I'll just say San Francisco. <laughs> okay, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So satellite engineer, what does that yeah. mean exactly? Are you talking about, like, space satellites? Um, Are you talking about, like... No, uh, not space satellites, like the ground satellites. It would be cool if it was space satellites. That'd well, he's be still beaming, you know, frequencies out there, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, does he have his degree in engineering? Or did he, like, you go know, to school I for really, engineering? I really, I don't think he does. Well, let's interview him instead. We should. We should. <laughs> and then your mom let's being get him like, on the phone. Your mom works for the, the Apple company, huh? Yeah. So what, is, what does project manager mean? Does she, like, get you free cell phones and shit? You know, she gives us discounts, actually, which is cool. That is cool. Yeah. Uh, she mostly just uh, manages the buildings to make sure everything's uh, running safely. So, right. like, say she'll get an email from somebody saying, oh, the toilet doesn't work or some shit like that, yeah. and she'll she'll fix it. Yeah. So basically, send she's the a, fixer. Send a gene over here. Basically, so, yeah. Uh, faci- like a yeah, facilities project. Yeah, That's yeah. Cool. And, and she's, she's so into her job that anytime she comes to a place, like say she comes to my place and she'll like she'll notice like something's off and she'll be like, oh, you should fix this or uh, the facilities person's not doing their job. Over right. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, she'd have a field day in my apartment. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, and then you, you have a brother. I do. My half-brother uh, from my father's side and uh, marriage before uh, my mother. He's uh, 38. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's also one who really got me into films. He got me into obscure films, mm-hmm. like not not the mainstream type of films. Give me some. Think. Give me like a couple examples. Uh, let's see. Well, he he likes to get me into uh, foreign films, like the horror. Uh, for, sorry, foreign horror films. Like there's a movie called Audition. I don't know if you ever heard yeah. of that. Oh my god. That. You ever seen Battle Royale? Oh, yeah. He got me into that one. I that love Battle Royale. That one's crazy. That's that, a cool movie. Like, if you want to see Hunger Games, watch that. Uh, I'd rather people watch that than Hunger Games. No, that's what I mean. Like, if you if you want to see a good a version good of Hunger Games, of yeah, watch yeah, yeah, Battle Royale. Yeah. Sure. Uh, are you on the uh, Jennifer Lawrence kick? Are I was. You? Not I'm, anymore. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not in. I don't, like, never, her. I don't like her personality. I, I, I used either. to. I, I, I know it's unpopular, but I, I'm not feeling it. I will say that. Sorry, j Yeah, no, she's. So gorgeous. I used to have a huge crush on her. Uh, when I first saw her in Silver Linings Playbook, I'm like, damn, she is so good. And then I was biased when it came to American Hustle. Uh, but it wasn't until I heard what she said, how she feels about her fans, where I was like, oh, I don't know how I feel about you anymore. And just like, she Oh, just, what did she say about that? I don't know. Um, she says that when she's out in public and if someone comes up to her, she'll just act rude on purpose just to get them away. I'm like, that's oh, stupid. That's, thank you. That's ridiculous. Well, I remember what she she said something really snooty when she got nominated for Silver Linings that oh. about beating Meryl Streep or something like that. And I was like, <laughs> "Wow, you're yeah. disrespecting one of the people that built what you're doing. What are you talking about? I Just so disrespectful. Such a child." Another thing that really annoyed me was because she's in those X Men movies, right? Mm-hmm. The fact that she's playing a Mystique, who is a character who has to be in full, you know, makeup and all blue. Well. She kind of refuses to do that. So very rarely do, does she get in all blue in those films now because it takes a long time. They're to CGIing get... the blue on her? Um, or they're not putting the blue on her at all, which is kind of annoying. Like the last movie they had was Apocalypse, and she's mostly like Jennifer Just Lawrence. human form. The human form. 
which is annoying. And it's like, you're an actress, you know, and you got to... If this is the part... Is sitting through makeup fun? No, it's torture. Once you get done with it and you get to perform in it, it's amazing. Yeah, because, I mean, I feel like once you see what you look like, then it kind of changes, you know, the way your performance, Mm -hmm. you know? And I I guess that's the difference between a movie star and an actor, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. There's the Tom Cruise and there's the Tom Hardy, Mm -hmm. you know? And, I mean, personally, I, I mean... I'm Tom Selleck. (laughs) <laughs> Tom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that mustache. Uh, so, Vogel, that sounds like a German name. Have it you ever like, looked into your family lineage? I have not, no. I know that it means bird. Bird? Yes, yeah, Vogel means bird. Steven Bird. Steven Bird, man. I fly, bro. You that's so fly? That, that's my life, man. Uh, would you ever do that 23 Me thing? What is that? It's like the thing where you like spit in a tube and send it in. They go through your genealogy, figure out your lineage, and they can pinpoint... Where your family, uh, you know, well, if I'm just spitting, then from. sure, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Right, they, yeah, uh, it's but like weird. apparently, they can figure out exactly what town your family came from, say, oh, if shit. they came from Germany or maybe they came from Austria, really? Yeah, they can figure Austria. that shit out. They come from Austria, <laughs> like the oak. That's why I love Schwarzenegger yeah, so much. Yeah, you just like you're just seeing, seeing a bit of yourself in there. Uh, oh god. <laughs> I mean, I've done, I've done, I've, I have done quite a bit of it. I don't know that I would do the Twenty Three and Me thing. I'm not just going to give my DNA over to some company that's owned by Google. Oh, isn't that uh, creepy? That, they, that's Google weird. owns that shit, and they're. They, well, how do they know for sure? Like, what if they're just bullshitting you? Like, just to who knows? Yeah, so. It's not even like a for sure thing. Like, no. Oh yeah, yeah. Vogel. Yeah, you're German. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I know. Yeah, I know that. Thank you. <laughs> or like, what if it was like, ah, Stephen Bailey? Uh, we've traced your lineage back to Japan. Like, what the? F- <laughs> no. <laughs> this is bullshit. This is fake. You're uh, like, ah, uh, what? <laughs> they just like check your social media to see what you say, and then they they just give you that information back to you. <laughs> they would do that. They would. I don't know. Like, I I did the genealogy.com. Like Website for a while, oh, yeah. uh, just like because I've always been fascinated by it, mm. and I find so many people. I ask them, I'm like, um, "Have you looked into your family tree?" Yeah. I get a lot of nos back, and I'm not sure what that is, but like, or why I care about it so much. I think there was a lot of pressure on me because my last name Bailey um, isn't my biological father's last name; it's oh. my grandfather's name, and he didn't have any sons. I'm the last Bailey living. Oh, wow. So I have a bit of pressure on me. But also, yes, like, do. looking into, like, that lineage, I always cared about, like, what generation American am I? Mm. And I am fifth. Mm. Um, right? One, two, three, four, four. Yeah, fifth. I'm fifth generation. Um, I think sixth on my biological father's side. Nice. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, actually, no, maybe, no, I think I'm... It doesn't matter. But, like, uh, I've always liked that stuff. And, like, my Aunt Gail gave me this um, handkerchief from my, like, my great-great-great-grandfather that mm-hmm. he brought over from my German side. So they, part of my, I'm half Irish, half German. Oh. Wow. With a little bit of, like, Cherokee and English and stuff I have a little like bit of uh, Irish in me, too. And uh, so they, anyway, she gave it to me. And I was like, this thing came, this piece of cloth was from Germany was carried on and given from person to person to person and now lives with me. Like, I think it's... Was this like Pulp Fiction with the gold watch? (laughs) I took this out of my ass. (laughs) You, little man, I give to you. (laughs) I give to you this watch. This watch. This watch. Your father. (laughs) I would love... Who, like, who... Would you... I don't know if I could work with him. But I would love to work with him. I would, too. I would just stare at him the whole time. I think it depends on the film. Like, if it's a funny film, yes. But if it's a serious film, I... Where he's coming up to you and, like, trying to intimidate you. Yeah, well, you know, I would just feel honored to be like, oh, cool. Yeah. (laughs) I I would... That's what I'm saying. I would just stare at him. I don't know if I could actually, like... I think back in the day, yes. Because, like... His legend continues to build and grow, and he becomes more... He's more... Yeah, yeah. He's turning that... Like how you said Schwarzenegger is holding on to his accent. I think Walken's turning that side of himself up. He probably is. He probably sees, you know, it's kind of like... It's a thing. So he's like, okay, I'm going to, you know... I'll live up to it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
absolutely sell what you got, man. Because I, I think about you know his scene in uh, True Romance with Dennis Hopper, and like he he was a tim- intimidating as shit. You yeah. Know? And if it worked with him back then, like that, holy shit. You ever seen King of New York? I've not. I want oh, to. Oh man, that's a great movie. To. We should we should uh, check that out. Yes. I'll, I'll show you that movie sometime. Um, so you said a, a bit ago you were talking about what you post to the internet. Yeah. I, I, you you have absolutely posted auditions. Yeah. Um. I think that's a brave move, man. I've never done that. I get I get scared sometimes because I'm like, you know, you're always going to have criti- criticism, which is fine, which you need, and I'm I'm always because for me I'm I'm a perfectionist. Um, I'm usually never satisfied with a lot of my performances. Do you feel that being a perfectionist stops you from being as productive as you could possibly be? Sometimes I feel like um, I think it. It can also stop me from being very creative, too, and not feel free, which is why I do improv classes to help bring that back. Because I, I took a, I'm not going to say the school, but I went to an acting school when I first got here, and I thought it was really cool, and then I was being poo-pooed every time I would do something creative, and that's more like me, and so then I felt like I had to be like this robot or a zombie at right. this school, which, you know, was my first time experiencing something like that, so it really, like really shook my world a bit, you know? Mm-hmm. And then it, it's been... Isn't it amazing how easily we can be... Um, uh, told something or criticized a certain way and it sort of makes us rethink everything? Yeah, it's, it's funny. C- yeah, I totally agree with that. I, and it's something that, you know, I have to get used to, and you as well. I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if you're already already used to it, but, like, people just... I cry a lot. You, it's, a, it's a common <laughs> thing, you know, you can cry. Because, you know, it, it's, especially, it, it only hurts when something you're passionate about. Mm-hmm. If you're very, very passionate about something, and, and you know, for, you know, with acting, like, you know, we, we've been told that we're, we're really good, or we're, we're great, whatever, and when someone says, you suck, mm-hmm. that's when you're like... Do I really suck? Then you start to question: Should I be out here? Should I just go back home? Or you know? And I'm and and always tell always, myself: No, always, always a thing. No, I, I have only really ever gotten negative comments when I've posted up demo reels. Oh. And I think people, like little trolls on the internet, will like type in demo reel and then just comment whatever they want, just because they. They they know that that's where it'll sting the most to an actor. Well, and they're hiding behind a keyboard too. Yeah, you know? oh, that, that's when they yeah. feel so tough. Very they wouldn't tell you in person, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> that, yeah. Um, I feel you though. So, how long have you been in LA? Uh, three years. Three years. Yeah. And uh, what do you what do you think? Like, are you are you going to stay in LA, or have you thought about like I'm the only... other hubs at all? No, I'm going to stay in LA. I feel like the way I feel is if I try to move somewhere else. It's going to shift. You know what I mean? So I might as well just stay and, and wait it out. And then it builds time for me to, you know, perfect my craft and just to, you know, dab into other things as well. Because like we were talking about earlier about it not being your time, and it's fine. If it's not my time right now, then I accept it. And I will just keep mm-hmm. doing what I'm doing until my time is ready. Right. You know? Right. Um, what... Are you into that's just yours? Like, because so much of your life is acting, entertaining other people, when it's just you at home, what is just yours? Uh, Is there a TV show that you watch that you don't watch with friends or family? Is it, is it like, do you, are you into meditation? Like, what is just yours? What do you do when it's like not related to acting, but you need to uh, have something to keep you sane? Man, that's a good question. I, I guess probably movies, you know? Mm-hmm. And in particular, horror movies. I I love watching horror movies, even if they're terrible. I don't know. It just It's a good way to just escape. Mm-hmm. Well, just movies in general, I guess. It's a good way to escape, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, other than that, I guess exercise. I, I've just been doing that you a like lot more. You like to pump iron? <laughs> I have now. Not before, but yeah, you know it's it's hard because like when you're not say working or acting, you're just like, what do I do? <laughs> what should I do? Like, what do I do with all this time? Like I don't deserve to just hang out and just relax and chill, you know. You well, that's what I when I ask you, I was like, how much time are you putting in? You know, yeah. I think, and I, you know, people are probably so sick of me talking about this, but 
you are an entrepreneur. Yeah. You are a small business, and people generally, like the public, doesn't understand sort of how much time and money gets spent on, you know, I always tell people the same thing. Like, if, if you're starting, let's say, let's take acting out of it. You're starting yeah. a, a small, um, you know... Business. Business, and you're selling... Uh, you, you open a record, record store. Sure. You're going to need to find a space to sell it. Mm-hmm. So the acting equivalent would be like YouTube, social media. That's where we sell our product. Uh, you would send out... You would have flyers posted, maybe. We send out postcards to casting directors, agents, and managers. Um, sometimes you're going to give free samples. Again, that's your videos on YouTube, whatever. Yeah. Doing showcases for people. Mm-hmm. Doing plays for free. Student films. And you're going to want to make sure your your product is as good as it can be. So you're going to classes to make sure that your craft is as strong as it can possibly be. Right, right. Um you know, all the things that a small business owner would go through, we go through. Mm-hmm. And when your business gets big enough, you make an LLC for yourself, as you would with your company. Uh, you would create a website. You would... Um, some people carry business cards. I don't really carry the business cards around. Um, I always just say, follow me on Instagram. We'll connect through there. You know. Um, but some people do, and all the power to them, but I'm not spending... Uh, you know, money's, money's not... Uh, a fun thing to spend. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, like, yeah. it's it's so much work. And then on top of that, you should be spending as much time as possible actually acting. Yeah. Right? So, like, it takes a lot of hours. And if you're spending 40 other hours a week at a job to make the money, which is your capital mm-hmm. to put into your business, mm-hmm. you're spending 80 hours a week just working and grinding and pushing towards something week yeah. after week after week. And then you go eight years in, and you, you're you're exhausted. <laughs> and then you have people critiquing you, saying, "How come you haven't made it yet?" It's very difficult to to find that balance. How do you keep the balance to continue making progress but keep your survival job at the green siren? And yeah, that's when the inspiration has to come in, you know. Like feel feeling that inspiration to keep you going, you know, or that fire, as I say, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's not an easy thing, like you said. Um, I feel like going back to the whole, you know, what do you do to keep that going? Mm-hmm. I, I don't, maybe I don't do as much as I should. I like to improv a lot, like with my roommates, because mm-hmm. they're also actors as well. So that is one way of, you know, helping yourself with that. Um, but yeah, you know, that's a good question. I think just, uh, Keeping yourself inspired really, really does help a lot. Because if you're not inspired, then, you know, you can easily tell yourself, yeah, you don't need to do this. Do something else. Yeah. I mean, it's so... Also knowing what choice to make next. Like, There is know, no right choice. You just, you just make the choice, honestly. Yeah. I feel like, like you, you know, know? Levels of importance... On a choice, like, is it more important to do a play reading in your living room with friends and really connect people and have fun? Or is it more important to make that short film for the... Both. You know? Yeah. Do both. Exactly. It doesn't matter, like, which one you do first as long as you do it, right? I think so. I mean, it's just, you know, and this is where it comes into, like, doing things for results, which is something I've, over the last year been just preaching about and trying to get away from is Mm. I used to do everything for a result like if I do the if I take this class and put that on my resume then it'll be more impressive to casting directors I'll get more more attention or if I if I go to this class I'll meet this person and that'll be a a thing or whatever if I go to this casting director workshop and meet that casting director I have a better shot of getting on the show that I want to or whatever so you're you're setting up expectations for yourself oh my god and I think that's a problem heartbreak it's a huge problem that's a problem problem. yeah I it's funny you you mentioned that because me and my roommate were talking about you know when you set expectations for yourself and you don't make them Mm -hmm. you get down on yourself heartbreaking yeah yeah, you feel like you're not doing something right Mm -hmm. and you feel like uh, you know it's going to take even longer yeah for you but that at the same time you're setting more expectations Mm -hmm. you're setting expectations when you're going to make it 
you're setting expectations, uh, you know, when, I don't know, when you're, when you're going to get your feature done or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. setting expectations is a big downfall for actors. I think you should have a guideline maybe, or like an idea Mm -hmm. or like a list of to do's what you should do. But I don't think you should be like, okay, I got to do it by this time or this time because you're going to go crazy. Yeah. Doing that, you know? And ex- you'll, well, I, you know, I'm, I, I talk about it all the time. I go really hard for 11 months straight, and then I have to take a full month off. Oh, yeah. Which, in that month, That's it's not do, that I'm doing yeah. nothing, but I definitely need to, like, I'll either feel so burned out that I can't even sit in front of my computer to edit anything or write anything, mm. or, like, I'll go into a depression and, you know, I haven't kept it a secret that I, you know, am working through you know, working on how to um, So you're not having a balance. Yeah, yeah. So you're not having a balance right now. You know, yeah, yeah. I so, understand. like, figuring that out. But, you know, as far as the guideline goes, what's on your bucket list as far as acting experiences you'd like to have? Oh, man. Well, um, being on a TV show would be really cool. If you mean, like, as a series regular kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, a series regular would be cool. Um, yeah. What if it was, like, a really bad show, like, I don't want to say any names, because what if they <laughs> don't hire me now, because I'll take a job, but let's say you. it's, like, a really crappy sitcom with, like, in front of a studio audience, and the jokes are terrible, and the plot is terrible, and you're playing a character that you don't like. Would well, you still take it? It's a job, you know, and I, I've always been told, no matter what job you get, always give it your all, no matter what it is, you know, mm-hmm. and I... I still stand with that, you know, because I don't mind. Like, okay, for instance, Gary Oldman. Sure. Gary Oldman has your boy, done, your favorite. Uh, it's my favorite actor. That was in the world. such a cool experience that I was so proud to give you. Oh man, I took I know. you to. I thank uh, you so much for that. What's the name of the movie? The Darkest Hour. Darkest Hour. Yeah, to see him. He did a Q and A out here in L.A. and oh. I had a screening. I got into and I took you to see it. It was that was it was, it was very cool. You were <sighs> so excited. Was so cool. And I felt like that was. This sounds like I'm patting myself on the back, but it was more, like, awesome for me to see it. It felt like it was life-changing for you. It, it was. Like, and now I've seen my hero. I have. And I, and I, it's funny because I walked home and I kind of cried a little bit because I thought to myself, why didn't I go down there to take a picture with him? I told you to go. I know, but at the same time, because I told my brother that, too. I was texting him, and I was like, dude, I, I can't believe it. I just I feel like I missed a big opportunity by not taking a picture mm-hmm. with Gary Oldman. He's like, well, think of it this way. He's just going to look at you as a fan. You'd rather work with him on set. Correct. And I'm like, there we go. So I felt much better, uh, you know, him Did you read that. that he retired, though? Stop I'm just kidding. It. I'm kidding. Stop <laughs> it. Stop it. <laughs> that, that, oh, God, that would crush me. I'm, I swear if that happens tomorrow, well, I'm going to be so oh my sad. God, that'd be so hilarious. You <laughs> get an audition. So sad. You get an audition for a movie. You book it. He's yeah. attached to it, and then he drops out. Oh, I would break my heart, man. Oh, man. Ugh, that's that's no. hilarious. But uh, what I was going to say was uh, with Gary, like, he's done some terrible movies, but he still gives it his all, you know? And that's what the one thing I really appreciate about him is that no matter what he's in, he'll still give his 100%. Well, and he's learning from it. Yeah. But you know? also with that, like, he's sort of one of those guys that, stays steady working but yes he does he does because he's done so much he's still got so many great films great and, and he's also he's not he's not a star you know he's not like uh, a face that everyone's like face, yeah. but he he's that's why I love him so much because he's a chameleon because like I've, I've showed people who are you know not familiar with him I'm like I show him Jim Gordon picture of mm-hmm. that and Sirius Black yeah. I'm like, this is the same guy. And they're like, what? Mm-hmm. That's the same dude. I'm like, Who exactly. is also the same guy in True Romance. Who's True also Romance, the same guy in JFK. Uh, yeah. That's well, why I love him so much. He like, Sid and Nancy. such a chameleon. Yeah. And then, you know, more recently with The Darkest Hour. Like, Darkest Hour, yeah. If you put that next to Jim Gordon and say, there you go. Yeah. Or like his character in, a, what was that movie I liked with Tom Hardy and Shia LaBeouf? Oh, Lawless. Lawless. Yeah, he's oh not my. even in it that much. And no, he's so but he's good. still great. And it yeah. was like, why didn't they expand on that? I would have loved it, honestly. That I think that movie could have been longer. I have a thing right now where like I feel like they keep like studios keep setting these arbitrary rules on time with movies, and it's forcing certain movies to like miss. They cut Important certain points. things. Yeah, like, yeah. Like going back to the Nun. I hate to keep like talking about this movie uh-huh. like this, but like. 
I think it could have been 10 minutes longer. I would have liked seven more minutes of build up in the beginning, and I would have liked a more fleshed out ending. Well, uh, yeah, I would have, I mean, I personally would have changed a lot of things about that movie. Because, mm-hmm. for one, and I'm not trying to give any spoilers Spoiler for people alert. who have not seen it, but the nun, Valak, is not even in the movie that much. Right. They talk about her a mm-hmm. lot, you know, and I'm just, I'm like, what is this movie called? Well, yeah, exactly. Horror like church? The actual, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was more an homage to, like, The Exorcist than anything else. And y- even then, that's a terrible homage, man. That, yeah. You know, or The Omen. You could say The Omen as well. Oh, there you go. You yeah. Know? I don't know, man. Um, See, th- those two movies right there, classic horror movies. Yeah. All long movies, mm-hmm. almost three hours. Slow. Build up. Slow build, build up, up. That's build up, why build up, build up, build up. I love that yeah. horror film, Hereditary, because it took its time. I still haven't seen it. You should. It. That movie's fantastic. Everything, I mean, I, I could be biased, but everything about that film was perfect. Maybe the ending's not as perfect, but the ending is still pretty good. Right. You know? And the acting, oh my God. I love when I could see great acting in a genre film. Oh, yeah. And not just dra- dramatic or, Well, you that's know. the thing about, like, going back to The Conjuring, like... Oh yeah, the, Patrick so, Wilson, oh, Vera Farmiga, man. even the Vera. family, the family yeah. too. Oh, yeah. yeah, they were amazing. Or like the the actors that are playing the monsters, like the the Red Demon and in Insidious. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, or, or even, I know there's um, no like monologues coming out of that actor, but just the performance given is so dynamic and, and crazy. That can go back to you know the whole Jennifer Lawrence thing when you see yourself in the makeup that mm-hmm. also helps your oh, performance man. a lot. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. I agree. Um, so wait, so so let's go back a little bit. So sure. we were talk. We you, you talk about like the improv class. And I know yeah. that you've like you've trained, but like you went to college for theater, right? Yeah. What what college did you go to? I went to uh, it, it was a uh, community college called Ohlone in Fremont. They had a really good. Uh, I feel like you're just making up words. <laughs> <laughs> Ohlone. I went to Bologna. I went to a Bologna, Bologna University. I went to a Bologna in Shma 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 City. <laughs> uh, so what was that? What was tell me? Tell me what that was like. Did you act before that? Yeah. I, oh, so did you start? When did you start? I acting? started acting when I was nine. I did a lot of community plays at my community theater. Okay. Who um, pushed you to do that? Was it just you? It was no. It's funny because it, during that time, because it was summertime, and my mom was always trying to find some kind of outlet for me to be a part Were you of. Hyper. I was hyper. Yeah. yeah. And she she worked, so we didn't really have a babysitter. So she was great like, okay. babysitter. Oh yeah. So she's like, okay, what should we do? And we saw there was an audition for a play for state fair. I was nine years old, uh, like I was saying, and so an audition. I ended up getting in there. Got I got two parts, three lines all together. Nice. One of them was coming up because I was a bartender, and that was you were a nine year old bartender. I was a nine. That is bartender. irresponsible. I know. I know. I probably uh, what put state too much alcohol this? in those yeah. drinks. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, that was my first exposure. And what's funny, true story, the first night, opening night, I have my big speech. Mm-hmm. I'm like this little nine-year-old kid in this big-ass suit that yeah. obviously Doesn't does not fit, fit him properly. Yeah. He's walking out, and he was told by the girl who's supposed to, because he's supposed to introduce uh, the singer in the show, And I was told by her, she's like, I'm going to be right behind you because I was nervous. My first time, uh, sold out show. Mm -hmm. So I walk out and I stand there, not saying nothing. And then I turn around, she's not there. Oh, great. I look back again, turn around again, she's not there. And then according to my mom, she thought, "Uh uh-oh, he forgot his lines. Here we go. And then I just went into it, said the whole thing, Mm -hmm. and that was that. So that little second, and then you're off and running. Yeah, it was just a, a small delay, and then right after that, in character, and then did that. There's, <laughs> there's a power in silence. There is. There is. There really is. As we're silent. Oh, shit. I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of the listeners uh, think that. Like, they want to tell me that. There's a power in silence, Stephen. Uh, so, okay, so, so, like, what... Keep going. Like, what was the road after that, after State Fair? After like, that, uh, I, I was in The Hobbit. I played Gollum because I could do the voice. Precious. And uh, uh, I did more shows. And then eventually uh, got into high school, mm-hmm. did the drama program there. Got really close with the teacher there. Great woman, Kayla Schwartz. Um, How close? Oh, very close, very close. She was like a second mom to me. Oh, that's cool, man. See, yeah. I think that's very important, like... So many teachers, um, 
can make that impact. And it's, I think the most important thing for an actor is to have a good mentor. Yes, I agree. And that's one thing I was looking for out here that I have not yet found. And maybe I won't find it. Who knows? But I will always have, because uh, I have two mentors, one in high school and one in college. And the one in college was like my second dad or grandpa. His name was Tom Blank. Amazing still around. Guy. He's still around. Both, Amazing guy. Both teachers still around? Both teachers. Still in still contact around. with both? Oh, yeah. Dude, I, see, that's so cool. I let them know everything that I'm doing. Just, that's great, man. Yeah, and they're they're so proud, happy, and they, they know it's a process, so mm-hmm. I don't have them ask me what's going on. Yeah. Why aren't you doing anything? They, you know? they know. They yeah, know. they know what's up. That's cool. Um, so what, you know, in that time period from like nine to senior year, what yeah. were your favorite, give me like a couple of your favorite roles that you got to play. Ah, uh, nine to senior year in high school? Um, I, I was the title Bugsy Malone Jr. in a gangster kind of fun play. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I was in Greece. Uh, or were you Danny or were you Everyone Finicky? thought I was going to be Danny, but I couldn't sing for shit, so I was one of the uh, greasers. Uh, his one name was birds. Roger. Roger? The king of the Mooners is what they called him. Yeah. Got it. So uh, did you show your ass on stage? I didn't, but I wore cheetah boxers to make up for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. I gotcha. And uh, it was one of those things because I had a song I had to do, <clears throat> and I knew I couldn't sing. So what I did was I was more animated and made it more fun mm-hmm. to the point where you could overlook my bad singing because I was, I was making it more entertaining. Right. And I had uh, a duet with someone who was a good singer, but she was also so good at improv and she was good at uh, reacting to what I was doing. Uh-huh. And her and I were always paired gotcha. in uh, community uh, shows. But yeah. She Interesting. Was yeah. So, uh, yeah, dude, That's I relate to that. I, I, I got dragged into audition for Oklahoma in senior <laughs> year, and I'd never done a, a musical before. I, I hate I, mean, I respect musicals, but I just I can't sing. So You, you could thing. if you trained, because if, 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 I was the worst of the worst. Oh. Like, I was asked like th- three or four times in the beginning, are you tone deaf? I, you know, one of my directors who in the community play, she, she for sure said I was tone deaf. Yeah. But Kayla, my my high school drama teacher, said no one's tone deaf. It's no just, it's practice and more figuring practice. out how to exactly. connect your mouth to your friggin' ears. And exactly. it takes a lot of practice for some people. Yeah. Any, it, but that's, see, that's, I want to demystify so much of the bullshit that gets said about performing. Like, <laughs> singing is not a magical ability. No. It, it, it's vocal cords and ear recognition of pitch. It's like anything. You it's, just got to practice. You work it out and you practice and you get better at it. I am absolute proof of that because I'm telling you, I walk into this audition. I audition for Oklahoma. Can't sing. They're playing the piano, trying to get me to find some sort of pitch. Can't do it. I end up getting cast as the peddler man. <laughs> the what, peddler man. The peddler man. Hell yeah. A- Ali Hakim. Ali Hakim. Uh, so, <laughs> which was fun because I played him Chaplin esque. Um, oh. Bowler hat, cool. cane, like the whole thing. Uh, I played him very Chaplin esque and played him very funny. Mm-hmm. It's so weird because coming from Indiana, and this is many years ago before there was as much um, consciousness about not whitewashing everything. Oh, nice. um, and so I was on the last episode of the podcast, I was talking about how I, I played Chino in West Side Story. I played Allie Hackam in uh, yeah. Oklahoma. And like, but, you know, it was what it was. It was yeah. it was the time period or whatever. Um, and I, I hope to God I never offended anybody with my portrayal of them. <laughs> I, I remember I did get compliments from certain people when it came to, like, authenticity, so mm. it was good. But... Um, Back to the singing thing, couldn't sing, couldn't sing. Yeah. And I told the story in the last podcast. I found a role, which was the MC from Cabaret. And oh, it inspired me to go take uh, voice lessons. Yeah. And so I started taking them twice a week. And That's uh, great. I had like four or five months to prepare for this audition. And I just learned to do it. And even practicing it and getting through the performance of it, because I did get the role. Mm. Even doing it, I still look back, and I would ask people questions like, I don't think I was on pitch. And they're like, you were on pitch. You're being too hard on yourself. Mm-hmm. But I was always so hard on myself because so many people did so much damage to me by saying, you should, like, one voice teacher I had said, you should just not sing. Oh. And I was like, well, then I think I shouldn't pay you. And I walked out. Damn. Yeah. It was like crushing. It, it, but it broke my heart, man, because it was like, 
I was just trying to participate and see if I could do this thing. Yeah. And eventually I got good teachers that were encouraging and loving on me and stuff like that. And that's the same thing with like acting coaches. Like I've had acting coaches that broke my heart and like made me feel like shit. Mm. And so now, even now, like I'm outside of acting, like I'm more comfortable around women than men. Mm -hmm. So I'm realizing that I am more comfortable around a, a, a woman uh, acting coach than mm-hmm. a man acting coach. I see. Um, just because so much damage has been done to me in real life and in my performing life by men. Mm. Uh, however, the voice teacher that told me not to sing anymore was a lady, but she was just a mean old bitter, you know, You're gonna no run into nothing. Those. That's okay. You're going to run into those. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, I mean like, and then now like I still am working on it and mm-hmm. like I sing, I, I started playing guitar and piano so that I could oh, sing great. with it. Yeah. It, it was all about being able to practice singing and I don't even do musicals anymore. Not that I wouldn't if one came along. Uh, like I want to do last five years with Shannon before we age out of that. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's a goal. And that's very difficult music. That's Jason Robert Brown, who's one of the most difficult uh, musical theater composers of all time. But like, you could do it if you wanted to. Mm. You just got to take voice lessons. Yeah, that's true. Do you enjoy singing like when you're in the car by yourself? Um, I don't exactly sing out loud. Like It's one of those things where it's just, you know, I'll like lip sync. I'm, I'm a big fan of lip sync. I would, I would love to be, battle? yeah, I would love to be a part of that. You know, what's funny, uh, you know, you watch, uh, what was it, Jimmy Fallon, mm-hmm. you know, always, when he has a guest, he'll have him play games, and I always thought to myself, if I ever got on there, like, what songs I would do sure. for lip sync. I would, would do, be? Uh, I would do Bohemian Rhapsody, because I feel like I could be so animated, especially when the song kicks up. Yeah. And if I wanted to be funny... I would do I Touch Myself from Divinity. Oh, yeah, that's a good I one. I feel like I could do a lot with that. That's a know? good one. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. All right, so you, you finish high school, you it go worked. into college. Yes. That, that must have been completely transforming to you. It was. It was very different for me because uh, I got to work. I got to meet a lot of really very talented actors. And I mean, not that I'm saying that the high school ones weren't talented. They just weren't passionate about it. It's different when somebody commits their life to it. Yeah. Or like if you're just hanging out in high school, some of them are just hanging out after school. Yeah. To be around people. And those are the ones I met, um, the ones who were committed in uh, college. And Mm -hmm. they're still pursuing it. Like I know uh, somebody right now who's uh, in New York Mm -hmm. pursuing uh, Broadway. That's awesome, man. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't finish my degree. Same. Oh, you didn't? No. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't finish my degree either. How, how close my, were you? Um, well, here, here's, here's the funny part. I took all my general ed classes, mm-hmm. but apparently I didn't take the right acting classes to get that. And I had different counselors who were just guiding me in just opposite directions to the point where, you know, by the time... That's I, madness. Yeah. I think I was like in my third or fourth year, and I, and I remember, because uh, I wanted to, to transfer and, you know, get my degree. And the lady said, oh, you took all, you didn't take the right acting class. You took, like, two of the, two or three right ones, but there's some other ones you need to take. And I was like, oh, shit. And so I told her. How that, is that possible that you took the wrong acting class? That's what I wanted to know. What does like, that even mean? Well, like, I didn't take, uh, uh, like, a lighting class or... Oh, I see. That kind of thing. I like, see. I needed to take those yeah. as well, you know? Yeah, stagecraft, makeup, it, exactly. lighting, directing, playwriting. I took playwriting. makeup. I took makeup. But everything else, like the lighting in the, in the stage, I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, but I told my, my teacher at the time, his name is Michael Navarro, a really cool guy, and I told him, and he said, you know what? Honestly, if you are trying to break it into film, just drop what you're doing and just move to LA and just save the money that's what I did so 23 dropped it told my parents and you know they agreed. were they disappointed no not at all um, it was mostly for my grandpa my grandpa was the one who wanted me to get a degree that way you know mm-hmm. I had it yeah as he said in case acting didn't work out but in my mind like it's that's just you know a team there's no plan B you know so it's, yeah. it's just that so we we kind of had a lie to him at the time saying, like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's going to be doing this. And then, fortunately, he passed away. But I'm sure he's watching me now being like, yeah, you goddamn liar. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah, my pops was a big proponent of that, too, and I think yeah. he would have been highly disappointed that I dropped out as well. But uh, I, like you, went to, I went to Indiana University, South mm. Bend, and uh, 
on, again, the last episode, but, uh, a lot of carryover here, but, like, I, the program just wasn't a good fit for me. Mm. So it was like, why am I wasting my money and my time doing this? And it's not even, it wasn't even, like, a great program. I think, like, if any, if this is advice to young actors who haven't chosen a college yet, I would say if you're not going to go to the best school for theater, just go right into it and start studying at the, the acting coaches that are in these big cities. I agree. Because there's nothing wrong with that. There's tons of people yeah. that I know that are coming here from, like, Australia and just going to all these great schools yeah. and learning their craft that way. You don't need to go to college to do it. In fact, like, because the college curriculum is what it is, you're learning all these general ed courses, and you are taking, like, if you want to be an actor, you don't need to be taking lighting and stagecraft and all no. this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's, it can be helpful, because it could potentially get you a job in the theater, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know. I think I think there's more work. I think they should replace lighting with, like, a Suzuki method class and replace stagecraft with, like, Alexander technique. Sure. And all yeah, these yeah. important things that you're not able to really fully learn in college that, you know, you, the same way I think, like, in high school there should be a life skills class. Oh, yeah. Drop the things that aren't important. Now, we should also have auto. Bring that back, too. Oh, yeah. Because they took that out, and I don't know why they I did. I don't know why. Because uh, I'm not safety. good with cars. You safety. Know? I guess. Well, you know, the key goes in the ignition, and you turn that. <laughs> Let's start there. The oh, steering cool. wheel, if yeah. you turn it to the right, the car goes to the right. What? If you turn it to the left, it goes to the left. Okay, really? good. My mind is <laughs> <laughs> Um That was tough. No, I mean, but at the same time, like, as an actor, I'm one of those actors that thinks, like, the more knowledge you have of everything else that isn't acting informs the acting. Sure, yeah. So well, well, I, I think, you know, getting your general eds is a good thing because you can learn, especially, like, I think all actors should be interested in history. Sure. Yeah. And psychology and sociology. I you definitely have an interest in that. definitely agree with psychology and sociology. History for sure as well. But, yeah, psychology, that's one thing one of my professors told me. He's like, I, uh, he's just recommended taking psychology. I think it will really help with acting mm-hmm. just for in sure. general. You know? Do you need to know physics? Not really. No. 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 You don't need to know physics to play... Geometry? Uh, uh, yeah. You don't need that to, to, to you know, play Goodwill Hunting. It helps. <laughs> it helps, you know, yeah. to, to sort of understand the mentality that someone who has spent so much time studying physics, learning equations, and just spending time, like, just going through uh, problem after problem after problem mm-hmm. relentlessly to figure out just the answer to all these things like what must that person really be like they would probably be very independent very uh, antisocial secluded socially awkward type of person I would imagine yeah um you don't you don't um ingest that much information at such a young age without sacrificing your social life and if you sacrifice your social life you become socially awkward it's just, is it, but that's there you go. Now you're back to psychology. Like so what, what do you really need? Yeah. Um, I don't know what you really need. I don't know the answer to being a great actor. I just know that. Just do it. Just, just act. experiment with your life yeah. and figure out what's right for you. Well, I think that's life experience thing. too really helps. Oh, big time. Most definitely, just live Hard your life. Hard to play a dad if you haven't had kids. Hard exactly. to play a husband if you haven't been one. Hard, you know, whatever. It's 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 not impossible to play no, them. No, I mean there and, are ways you can try. Put yourself but. in that place and pretend and use what you have to relate to it. But the most accurate and truthful is if you do have kids. That's, you're right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, do you? Uh, what's your feeling on since you are going to be staying in LA? What sure. is your? Uh, I'm not a big fan of LA theater. <laughs> I think I, you know, I like what the Center Theater Group's doing. I like what A Noise Within is doing. Um, but there's so many crappy theaters out here that yeah. aren't doing great work. I've I like been the to Fountain one. Theater. Uh, yes, you have. Yeah, uh, you know which that's one. That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> we have so many mutual. Uh, uh, you want to know symbols. how I feel? Well, I mean, is theater important to you as an yes, actor? Yes, it is. I think it is because it's a good way to practice. I think, in my opinion, um, but it's also just good experience because when you are on stage, you have to be larger than life, and you have to like. Everything has to be to the power of 10, essentially, whatever. Um, I think that's good to always have with you because that way, say you're doing a film, you know how to tone yourself down. 
mm-hmm. rather than raising your energy up. Right. Because I feel like that's harder for people who aren't like that. You have to yeah. stretch both ways, I think. Like, yeah, for me, subtlety... I'm always constantly toning myself down to work on my subtlety on camera. Yeah. Um, because I came from the theater. So I only knew how to be loud and... Same. Uh, high energy. Yeah. And it's like, nah. Like, until you learn how to do a close-up where you're barely moving anything, you're not moving your eyebrows, you're only letting your mouth move the little bit that it has to. Until you learn how to do that, yeah, that's a skill, man. Yeah, it's not it's easy. It's a skill. It's not easy. It takes so much... Um, Especially coming from stage, like, you want to do so much, you know? What are your... Um, Dream roles for the theater. Do you have any? I don't. I have dream roles in general. I don't know if I can say, if I can, like, be specific when it comes to theater. Um, I mean, I would love to play, uh, I've always wanted to play Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird. I'm sure they could do, like, a, I know they've done theater versions of that. Yeah, uh, they're doing one right now with Jeff Daniels. Oh, really? Yeah, he's playing Atticus, Mm -hmm. huh? Uh, Oh, Aaron Sorkin did the play. The wow. play version that wrote it. That's going to be great. Yeah. Um, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Rick, which which role? R- Ricky Roma. Ricky? Yeah. I think it'd be a nice challenge, you know, because so many people play that part. You just bring in your own spin to it. Mm-hmm. Um, ooh, Pillow Man. Topolsky. All right. Yes. I love that part so much. It's probably would be something that would come later in life. Mm-hmm. Anything Martin McDonough. Yeah, he's great. I love his writing. Absolutely. Dracula too, just because I love Dracula. Right. <laughs> Would you want to play the young Dracula or wait till you're older and play the? Because in the Probably play, older. he does the transformation. I think older, because then I'll you know I'll have more experience with life. I think there's life. so many great roles for old men like Dracula or Willie Loman or uh, you know playing like um, uh, Scrooge. Yeah. You know, Ebenezer Scrooge. That would be fun. Uh, I don't know. There's so many great roles. I mean, I have a slew of them. I mean, I, I just love the theater so much. I'm, I'm such a, still a theater geek. Like, we, we try yeah, to go to plays all the time. It's Not great. at all. No. I, in fact, like, I, I think, again, like, I, I do think theater will become more popular and it'll swing back into being something that's more important now Good. that we have so much video everywhere for that to be the escape. Well, also, too, I think right now, because films are... You know, they're really formulaic right now, like, mm-hmm. and they're all just, you know, doing tropes and trends, and yep. that's why all the big stars are going to TV, you know, and that's where, you know, story is, and I hope that, you know, at some point we can, you know, bounce that back, like you were saying, even with theater as well, you know, and I, f- I feel like that'll be the next step, like, because, you know, we, we went from movies to TV, and now, well, even look not at, that I'm ranking them like, like everything, you know. Stand-up comedy is popular right now because of, like, all the Netflix specials coming out. Yeah. Like, the clubs are staying pretty busy, but that's going to flatline again. Mm-hmm. Improv shows are, like, very, like, hipster-esque. Like, you always see them, like, <laughs> full of, like, you know, that's what folks do or whatever. But I do think that theater, like, a lot of things need to be re- re- redone. But mm-hmm. I think that theater is smartening up and putting a lot more media, you know, using a lot more complex lighting, better set construction, Mm -hmm. uh, using video, better sound design. Like, everything is coming up in theater, and I think that it's giving... Because all of it is about who's giving the best entertainment value. And I think that it is a race. Yeah. It's not about importance, but it is a race on who's going to be more entertaining. And I think eventually theater will... Pull, pull more ahead than it... It's not ahead. I don't mean ahead. It'll pull... But it'll come up and be part of the uh, zeitgeist as far as some... Where where the interesting work is happening. Because mm-hmm. right now it is TV. There is a lot of... Have you watched Ozark? No, everyone keeps talking Holy about that. Holy shit. That's what I hear. It's like Breaking Bad, but... Like, it, it's basically a Breaking Bad... It's Breaking Bad's son, but... <laughs> In such a dark, weird, indie way. Ooh. It's really neat. I like um, it. It's like Bloodline. Bloodline was kind of like that for a Exactly, bit right? Yeah. Um, so a couple more questions, then we're done. We're coming up on two hours. That's two hours oh, already. Oh, man. That's fun. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so tell me about Clown Motel. This was, was this your 
This is the feature that's about to come out, right? Yeah, it comes out at the end of this month on the 29th. How did that come about? Was that... LA Casting. Yeah? I, uh, yeah. I uh, submitted for it on LA Casting, got a call, call back, or, you know, got an audition for it. It was a self-tape first, and the part was a, uh, a ghost hunting stoner. So well, that that's you <laughs> to a T, huh? I, uh, when I auditioned, I kind of do you partake like, in the uh, in the in the legal marijuanas? I do, yeah, I do. Is I that think, am I putting you on the spot? Yeah, a little bit. No, <laughs> that's okay. I mean, I, I, I to me, it, it helps unlock the creative side. Like, if I'm doing it, I'll be looking at a script, mm-hmm. or I'll be watching a movie. You know, because mm-hmm. I feel like I'll. I'll view it in a different way, and I think it'll sure. help expand. You know, uh, yeah, I, I I'm the same way. Yeah. Um, it also because you know it is a bit, I guess, self medication in a way because my brain is always going a thousand miles per hour same. that I can't think about one thing. Yeah. For a long time, so you know, a couple puffs, and all of a sudden I can like slow down mm-hmm. and just imagine. I don't use my imagination enough anymore because I'm Same. so overloading myself with busyness that I'm not allowing myself to, you know, because well, you, you know, let you something will, sit in the oven for a while and, 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 life, and bake. You know, you life know? just happens, and you just have to think about you know surviving rather than like you know creating a character or something like that. Or like even yeah, I mean, how much time to sit and think on a character like. Because you're thinking about all these other things. Like, say you have work the next morning, you're thinking about, oh, how's that going to go, you know? Checking my social media. That, too, yeah. Um, Recording these podcasts with you. <laughs> Getting in my way, man. Sorry. No. Uh, worth it. So, okay, so you, 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 you submit on LA Casting. Yep. What was the audition process like? Um, well, it was, it was interesting, you know. I, uh, I had a reader with me, kind of, I did a little stoner voice at the time. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to that too because I changed that eventually. But I did that, got a callback for it, and the callback was in person at the CAST, you know, the CZT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Formosa? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. By that target? <laughs> Which I go to when I wait, <laughs> when I'm like practicing, uh, rehearsing the lines as I'm walking around, looking like a madman. Oh, look at that t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was in person. And I won't get into details about what the scene was, but it was a very physical scene where mm-hmm. I have to run into something. Okay. And so I went, I think I told you about this, too. I remember it. You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went full out with this. I, I was supposed to, like, run into something. So the only thing that was there was a wall. So I ran into a wall, toe first. I kind of fucked up my toe for a little bit. And I was limping for some time. And I kept thinking to myself, man, if I broke my toe, I hope I got this roll, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think it was a week or two later, I get a phone call from the director offering me the part. And and after that, I got the script, read the script, laughed my ass off. I enjoyed it a lot. And I believe it was a month. Yeah, it was a month to prepare for whatever I can for this part and then it was a week of filming in uh, Tonopah, Nevada which was a lot of fun got to meet a lot of cool people mm-hmm. make some cool connections but yeah th- have you have you seen it yet? I have seen trailers and I've seen some scenes but I have not seen a like a uh, full cut yeah. full cut when do you will you, won't, you will you not be able to see it until it's fully released? not until the 29th yeah okay. oh so it's this month on 20, September this 29th month, yeah, yeah. and where will it be able to be seen? Um, I don't I don't remember exactly where it's at. It's it, it's on the trailer. It's in downtown LA. I know that for oh, sure. Oh, so they're doing some screenings first. Yeah, they're doing a screening for it first. Uh, that'll be the uh, premiere. Okay, on cool. The twenty ninth. Yeah. Nice man. Yeah. Uh, if I wasn't getting married the next day, I'd go with you. Oh. Uh, oh, sweet! It's on yeah, the thirtieth. On the thirtieth. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Uh, so okay, so and then you also booked another one. Yes. That, and you haven't filmed it yet. Not yet. So it, you just booked it. Yeah. It cool. uh, films in January. January What's to March. This one called? It's called Stand Still. Is it now, oh, so so Clown Motel. That's a horror film. That's right? a horror film. So that yes. must have been fun for you. Since oh, horror yeah, yeah. Because I love horror. Now, yeah. Stand Still. Is that also horror? That's a dramatic film. Oh, it's a drama. It's, okay. it's going to be a. What's it about? Um, I won't go into too much detail about it, but it's basically about two roommates who are both, I guess you can say, searching for meaning and happiness in their lives. One is suicidal, and the other one's an addict. 
Got it. Yeah, it's very heavy, very deep. That's um, awesome. I can't wait. Yeah. Well, so between those two things, yeah. you, you studied in college, you're still grinding away, mm-hmm. you're doing the self-submissions, mm-hmm. you know, um, you did a short of mine that I promise you is almost done. It's just <laughs> like, uh, you know. But That's right. I got eight million things. Fun. This You were really good at that. So we did a short. It's called The Intruder. And I wanted to do a commentary on uh, society and how violent we are. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you play this. It starts out. It's a close-up on your eyes. <laughs> and it slowly zooms out. And we see your full face. And then you have this really creepy smile. <laughs> and then we keep pulling out. We keep pulling out. And we see that you're in this orange jumpsuit. And you're an escaped convict. And that's all I'll really say on it because I am going to release it. But I, I, I loved what you did. It wasn't... Uh, I don't imagine it was a, totally a fun thing to do. Uh, wasn't too much action in there for you to do. Hey, any chance, you know? It's I'm a. Cool. I think it was a really cool, and that's probably why it's taken me so long, is because finding the right balance of what I'm trying to say mm. with such simple photography is uh, is difficult. But uh, you were creepy. I mean, it is creepy. <laughs> I'll show it to you before you leave. Uh, cool. I want to release it... Um, It'll probably be the first thing I release once I get back. Cool. Uh, Very cool. You know, I have a couple other things that I'm releasing. And I went through a, a bout of just not caring. Like, I couldn't get myself to edit. <laughs> I just couldn't. And then I started, I just started pushing myself to, like, because I'm editing this Drunk History video that me and Shannon did. Oh, I edited nice, a couple of vlogs. Nice. And now that I'm doing it again, mm-hmm. because, dude, I used to do it professionally. Okay. And then I would edit my own stuff as well, and I just burned myself out. And, but mm-hmm. once I started doing it again, and now that I've taken a break, I'm like, all right, this is actually, it's fun. You get a rush from releasing these videos and getting reactions from it, no matter what it is, even yeah. though I'm releasing, like, these vlogs, which is just me talking into a camera to potential actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still fun, you yeah. know? Um, but, yeah, I'll definitely get the Intruder release soon because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. It's pretty, it's, it's different for me because it's not what people have seen me direct before. Okay. Uh, out of the things that I've directed. Can't um, wait to see it. Do you think you're going to ever direct? Sure, oh, yeah. Uh, my goal is to direct horror. Horror and basically any genre films. We should do, I really want to do one of those anthology horror films. I think we talked like, about yeah, this Yeah, we need to, like, yeah. off microphone, like, get that shit going. Yeah. Because, like, I would love to do that. That'd be um, great. Just, like, you just gotta get like your a little Twilight like Zone. A, yeah, like, a, yeah, outer each, limits. have each thing be, like, 20 pages long. Sure. Then you got an 80-minute feature, yeah. and each person does their short, put it all together. That'd Boom, cool. you got it. Yeah. What do you think of uh, podcasts? Love it. Yeah? It's great. It's it's I'm so glad you came on to do it. Same. It's probably like my, my first one that I've ever done, I think. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> Look, see, this is why I wanted you on here. I get to break the, my cherry. the, the, Steven, the Steven Vogel cherry. Thank see, you. When, you, when you're blowing up, oh, just refer people back to this. Oh, this was your warm-up for your uh, Inside the Actor Studio, which brings us to... The end, we are going to do the PIVO questionnaire from the actor studio. Okay. So the studio. Let's, let's uh, hear it. Before we get into that, though, I, sure. I want to ask a couple of the questions that aren't part of that questionnaire. Sure. Uh, give me your top five favorite movies. Oh, I was hoping this would come. Uh, my top five always changes a lot, so I'll just give you a rough. This is in no particular order. Um, Dark Knight, of mm-hmm. course. Uh, Clockwork Orange. Great. Uh, John. in the rain. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. Nice. Um, what You're else? a big Kurt Russell fan. Ah, huh? uh, yeah, I love <laughs> Kurt Russell. I love that you like the the old school guys. I, like, do, I do. You haven't. You're like me. You have like this sort sort of old school feel to you. Yes. yes. And uh, I think that's going to get in our way a bit as we try to find work. But also, I, I think, think we got to bring that back, though. I think that's our responsibility that's is to bring to some do. of that old school flavor back. When they want us back, we'll be. That's ready. what we'll be. Yeah, yeah, that's what we'll bring. Uh, so, um, yeah. So the, so, the, so the thing, Clockwork Orange, Dark Knight. Uh, they got two more. I would say uh, Breakfast Club would be on there. Nice. nice. And I will throw out the very first Blade Runner. Wow. Yeah. And you're a big Harrison Ford fan. Too. I love Harry. So would your top five actors be like Harrison Ford, nope. Kurt Russell? Who, mm-hmm. are, who are you talking I would, about? I actually, you know, as much as I love those guys, they're, they're in a different category. Okay. You know? So who would your top five favorite actors be like uh, most in, that have most had an effect on you? Gary Oldman would be on there. Robert De Niro. Um, Paul Newman, too. I yeah, love great. Paul Newman. Um, Heath Ledger. And I would say Tom Hardy. Wow. Yeah. Jay, I was going to say James Dean, but he'd be in my top ten for sure. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Not a you're not a Brando guy, huh? Not a I Brando love guy. Brando. I love him, but see, my Brando is De Niro. Gotcha. You know, I've never like this is so sad. We talk, to say, you but love I Pacino. Am, I am a Pacino guy, and, and I, I don't I see understand I the it. love of De Niro. Really, I think wow. he's good. I don't under. I don't know why people put him as the one of the greatest of all time. There's just something about get him. I don't know. And I and is I, it is it the energy that he puts off? What is maybe it? maybe it's his presence. I don't know because like the films that I've seen, like uh, Raging Bull, I think is his greatest performance from what I've seen. He's I, I see, but the thing is, like, he is good in it, especially in that final scene where he's looking in the mirror. Yeah, that and, and his freak out and when he gets locked up. Yeah. And, oh yeah. Him but and, I, him and I Pesci think was going so it. much of exactly. I think so much of it was Pesci was so good at like serving him up, and then Martin Scorsese, who is uh, you know anyone who knows me knows that that's, that's probably your guy, right? yeah as as important as like a James Dean or an Al Pacino has been to me. <laughs> I would say Martin Scorsese has been more important. Tarantino would be for me. Yeah. I mean, but these guys are, you know, Christopher Nolan, David Fincher. These Nolan. are all these guys that, like, have so much to do with where acting is today. Yeah. They are putting these people in these zones and, and showing them the way to go, mm-hmm. um, which is what a director should be. A mm-hmm. director, and I, I, we talked about this again last podcast episode, talking too much <laughs> about acting, but, like, the um, the act the directors that are like be happier that's not directing no 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 that that doesn't help us either and it's yeah. like okay so then you have you yourself as the artist you have to you know I tell directors all the time I'm not a puppet <laughs> that's I, good I'm, he- I'm here I'm a craftsman you wouldn't tell a, a a carpenter lay the wood down you would tell them how you wanted that you know yeah. if, if you were that particular about it especially when you have you a vision say, of what you're if doing you have a vision you know? tell me the vision don't just exactly. say lay the wood down. Yeah, I'm a craftsman. Uh, what inhibits you? Like, what, what, what is the thing that holds you back? That holds me act, or what'd you say? Holds you back. Like, what inhibits you? Like, oh. or uh, you know, like what, what, what's, what's, what's a block for you? Like, we talked a little bit about like uh, perfectionism. Mm. Would you say that that would be it, the main thing? Or, uh, yeah, I think so. And just, I, I can sometimes like. You know, like anybody, I can be scared to mm-hmm. try something. Sure. You know, and so I guess in general, just me, I hold you myself back. You asked me a question, and, and, you know, I've known you for almost two years now. Yeah. No, I've known you for two years now. I just came up on my two-year anniversary there. I think. Damn. Yeah, crazy, right? I'm already past three. Uh, so when we were first talking, you would ask me questions, which is cool, because, mm-hmm. like, I, I, I don't ever really do that, and I probably should. You would ask me questions about, like, what do you do ifs when it comes to acting? And uh, it's so cool to, like, even though, like, I'm still, like, learning your work and, like, seeing what you do, mm-hmm. it's cool to watch you, like, grow as a person. Mm-hmm. It's cool to um, see you analyze acting in a lot of the way that I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, you know, and I, I talk to so many actors, and I'm going to continue to, and each person's different, but I, I see so much of me and you and you and me and like Great. and like the uh there's just a lot a lot of similarity there and i think that um if you're like me there's a lot that can get in your way but and you said that what frees you is the inspiration right from inspiration from yeah actors is there is there anything like besides like like you said working out or whatever like is there um is there a particular movie that you watch I think like Dark Knight obviously is. You know, it's it's funny. Uh, probably not Dark Knight. I I now I'll watch just scenes from mm. Dark Knight, and I'll just watch Heath Ledger scenes because I'm I'm the kind of person right now I can't handle really long movies unless it holds my attention. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think that is about? I don't know. It's just like if you don't get my attention, I'm not going to care, and I'm just it may, it's more of one of those things where you're just thinking about other things. You know, unless right. you can hold my attention. Um, I think part of that stems from, like, because entertainment is an escape, mm-hmm. you don't want to escape right now. You want to be in it, and you want to be productive. You want to do something. That, that You're right. That is another thing where it's like you're watching. It's like I, I don't like watching the Oscars anymore because I'm always telling myself, you know, like, hey, you should be there. Mm-hmm. Don't watch this. Just be right. there. You know, right? Like, or you, sometimes I won't even like go to the movies that much anymore because I'm just like, don't do it because you're you need to be up there. 
Right. You need you to know? be doing it, not watching it. You're wasting time. Don't sit on the bench, get in the exactly. game. Exactly. Don't sit on the bench, watch the game, get in it. Exactly. Crazy. Yeah. All right, let's do this Pivo questionnaire, and then I'll let you get out of here. Let's do All it. All right. Steven Vogel. Yes. Question one. All right. What is your favorite word? Hmm. Favorite word. That's a good question. I've never even thought about this before. While I think about this, you have to edit this down. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> so it good. doesn't take a long time. Just let your gut oh, talk, man. Oh man, what's a good word? We'll say beautiful. That's a good word. What's your least favorite word? Pretentious. Nice. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? What's your turn on? Ooh. Like-minded creative artists. I love meeting those people. I love meet. Actually, no, I'll take it back. Passionate people. They're, I love meeting passionate people because then it makes me passionate, mm-hmm. depending on what it is, you know. Right. I mean, they could be passionate about, I don't know, um, science. And if you talk to me and you're like, oh, blah, 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 this, 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 and I'll be like, oh, fuck yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, Gets you love it. it. That's cool, you know? Yeah. I respect that. Who said something to me about, like, I wish you would have been my science teacher or something? <laughs> Somebody said that to me, like, because I talk so <laughs> much about, funny. like, uh, you know, astrophysics and oh, shit like that. And, like, see. talk about, like, string theory and stuff. <laughs> and I, like, anyone who will listen to me. It, oh, it was, it was Jackie. Jackie. Oh, it was? Said that. Yeah, oh, Jackie goodness. said that. Um, Jackie. You know what's interesting? Your answer about passionate people. Yeah. That's an answer that I keep hearing. Really? From people here. I, I think it's because so many people here... We we see a lot of superficiality and they're we see a lot of there's not passion there and mm. that's why I like respect New York actors so much is because they're all passion. Oh yeah, New York's all about that Broadway, <sighs> the theater and like not yeah. worrying about fame and not worrying about the money, just doing it just for the sake of doing artist. it and doing it as well as you can. Creative. What turns you off? Negative people. Negativity in general turns me off. Yeah. Like if if you just talk your whole day about. You know, just being negative, not looking at the positives. I'm just like, oh, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Oh, kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? Fuck. You really pop it when you say it, too. I say it a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, I used to hate that word, too, when I was younger. Really? But now, like, I'm like, I curse like a sailor, you know? Yeah, well. I, I, Especially I think at work. <laughs> I know that around, yeah, no kidding. Around social media, there's a... This article that keeps popping around that people who uh, stay up late, curse, and are messy are smarter people. Oh. So. Damn. Good for I, you. I'm like all those right there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, what sound or noise do you love? Laughter. Laughter from anybody. Whether it's a baby, whether it's, you know, a loved one, your mom, anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, I love, I love the sound of laughter because it makes me laugh. You know, it, like, especially when someone's so tickled. Like, my, my best friend from France, his name's Marwin, he has probably the most infectious laugh I've ever heard in my life, to the point where if he laughs at something stupid, I'm probably going to laugh too. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. It really is. What sound or noise do you hate? Mm. I think maybe someone who sighs a lot. I sigh a lot. Oh, I do. I hate that. I'm just kidding. I catch myself doing it because I find that the reason I'm doing it is because I'm so, like, anxious that I have to force myself to do it so that I can get my breath back on track. Actually, you know what? I get worked up quite a bit. I take it back. Not sighing. I thought of something else. So when someone gets ready to hock a loogie, <laughs> it's disgusting. It is disgusting. Especially, like, say you're, you're okay, you're at, you're at some uh, restaurant, right, and you're mm-hmm. outside. Yeah, you're on the patio there, yep. and all of a sudden you're about to eat your bird, and you're, and you're like, "Oh, uh, come on!" I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I cannot stand when somebody snorts or does something like that uh, next to the microphone uh, because it's so it gets it, you hear all the phlegm, all the moisture, all the air. It's disgusting, nasty. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. No. Honestly, I, I, there's nothing else I'd rather do than act, to be completely honest. Like, there's, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know. There's, there's, I would half-ass anything else. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I wouldn't give it my all, so, 
It's funny because Sam say, Rockwell was asked this question. Yeah. And he said, gas station attendant. And they're like, <laughs> really? He's like, yeah, because there's no plan B when it comes to acting. Right. So let's say, let's just, I'm going to push you on this. Okay, sure. Acting's outlawed. Okay. There's no more acting. Okay. So what I'm do you a rebel. do? <laughs> what do you do? Are you just going to end your life? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, well, do you, you know, find okay. something I'll tell you, close, I'll tell you something I would do. If acting's out like, or mo- so then movies are just out and completely? Nothing. There's no more entertainment. It's oh, a dystopian okay. society. What about mu- music's out too? No. Okay. Maybe, uh... You can do music. I'd probably be a critic then. A critic? A critic for music. Because I was going to say I'd be a critic for movies. Writing for Rolling Stone? I guess so. Yeah. Cool. But that, d- that doesn't sound that great. <laughs> you, would you turn into the, uh... What's his face? Uh... The, in, um, Almost Famous? Oh, The Kid? No, or, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've only so seen that good. movie one time. Oh my I don't God, remember. Just, uh, since you like looking up clips, just look up the clip of oh, him uh, from that. Well, him in anything, honestly. Uh, I mean, God, he absolutely. Was, he was amazing. I mean, he's still probably the best villain in all the Mission Impossibles. Oh, yeah. You know, he's sick. Yeah. I but like. Boogie Nights, too. Boogie Nights. <laughs> I was going to bring that up. He like, read <laughs> my mind. Like, it's so, so funny. Could that be that more movie. different? That's a great character actor right he, there, too. He is. And for he somebody was. as pale. And, like, almost albino-looking as he was, like, to be as dynamic of an actor. It was all oh, about his craft God, and his skill. Yes. It had nothing to do with his look, really. No, and that's the thing. That's, that's brilliant. like, that's why, you know, I mean, I, I'm, i like, uh, preaching the choir here with myself. But, like, I'm always so worried about how I look sometimes. Because, you, you know, you, you kind of have to worry about how you look on, on the camera. Well, yeah, you know, a hundred percent. But with but with him, you know, it's not about so much like that. Like you never saw him like lose weight for a film, you know. Maybe Capote. I think he lost weight for Capote. Probably a little bit, but he's still he's still heavy. You know, he's still a heavy guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, he. I would have loved to have seen him do theater work. Oh. Apparently, his work in the theater was. I guess everyone talks about it as if it was the best work he ever did. I think I knew somebody who did see him in theater, and they said uh. he was amazing. It's too bad. He was fantastic. Absolutely. What profession would you never like to do? <laughs> Manage Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's your lucky day, because oh, Steven Vogel, you are promoted. Um, no! It, that, I think that's, like, always a fair, like, you get not, so caught up in a job like that that yeah. you're just, like, you're, you're stuck. It's a great survival job, for sure. Survival, yeah. Um... And it's tough because the longer you're there and the more you know, the more responsibility you're not forced to take on, but asked to take on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got a lot of benefits, the job. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah it's, it's tough because we aren't trying to um, be lifers with it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not that we go in there and we're not given 110 from the time we're booked to be there, but yeah. it's, it's tough. But because we work at a corporation, mm-hmm. the lines can get blurred. Yeah. But I understand. Uh, final question of your Pivo questionnaire. Mm-hmm. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <laughs> Already? <laughs> I don't know what that means. That's scary. <laughs> You're here now? <laughs> We're not ready for you yet. All right, no, yeah, that was a funny one. I remember Tom Hanks. He's like, yeah, back in the line. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be torturous. Like, if you had to relive your life over and over and over again the same yeah. exact way, I feel like that'd be a nightmare. Probably, yeah. Well, the bad parts of your life, for sure. For sure. Yeah. But if, if, you re- if you relive them, there's no way to relive something and not change it. Yeah. Or else... You just reset with no memory, but you then kinda, it wouldn't be painful. Yeah, you kind of alter it, though, right? So it's If like, you remember the living it before, then you would be able to alter it. There's no way not to alter it. Yeah. But if you don't remember it, then it's not painful. True. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I don't know where that came from. Oh, <laughs> probably from your Pivo questionnaire. Uh, anyway, well, this was a strong, strong interview. How do you feel about it? Uh, it was fun. A lot of fun. It was, it was fun. It was fun. I had a good time. It was good. I liked it. <laughs> I had a good time. Um, <laughs> can you, as the Joker, say thank you for listening to the Hollywood Happy Hour podcast? The Hollywood Happy Hour podcast. Okay. Correct. Yeah. 
Well, uh, thank you for uh, listening to the Hollywood Happy Hour podcast with your host, Stephen Bailey, and, you guessed it, the Joker. (laughs) Good. And that's that. That was Stephen Vogel, and we are at 223.42. Holy smokes. All right, I'm not going to take up too much time, but I got to say, this is episode number 15. I can't believe 15 episodes have gone by. I was going to say already, it's been like two years. I've done 15 two years, but seriously, like, this is episode 15. This is very exciting. That's an accomplishment. 15 episodes, and I'm unstoppable, and there's many more to come. Um, Got Ben Biggers coming up. Uh, got, uh, let me check my paperwork here. Um, yeah. And then I'm, I'm going to be recording with Gregory Fisher and, uh, we're going to do a mini soda with Shannon. That's going to be a lot of fun because we're going to be talking about all that special effects makeup stuff. Tell you guys a little bit about, you know, our story. We got married y'all. I mean, it's still fairly new. We just passed the three month mark. Um, there's been a lot going on. There's been a lot. But uh, I am very thankful to have you listeners listening along and uh, taking part in the process of whatever it is that I'm doing with my life. You know what I'm saying? All right. I love you very much, my, my dear happy hour listeners, my happy hoursers, my pals. But I'm going to get out of here. Okay? Love you, pumpkin. Bye-bye.